Today I want to figure out which evolution can beat Pokemon Yellow the easiest. To determine which one's better, I'll need a methodology, and here's how I'm going to work. I'll do an initial playthrough of the game with each Pokemon to determine where they struggle and get some preliminary results. By the way, I'll be collecting four metrics, real time, resets, level, and game time. Then I'll test various battles and use software to optimize the playthroughs, and finally I'll do a follow-up playthrough to put these optimizations into action and collect final results for the Pokemon. For each of the playthroughs I'll use the following rules. Only my starter in battle, no items in battle, no game-breaking glitches, exploits, or RNG manipulation, and no TM32, which is double team, until level 100. For a more detailed copy of the rules, check the video description. So now let's compare these Pokemon. Something that's interesting about all of the evolutions introduced to date, actually, is the fact that all of their types were originally special in Generation 1. Yes, I know Sylveon is sort of in a weird category there, like, it's the fairy type, but it kind of stands in like the dragon type evolution. Because if you didn't know in Generation 1, the dragon type is a special type. So all of their same type attack bonus moves will be moves that use the special stat. So let's compare their base stats. Something interesting about all three is the fact that their defense and special stats are are the same. They have 60 defense and 110 special. And then for the other three stats, they have a mix of 130 in one of the stats and 65 in the other two. So Vaporeon gets a lot of HP, like a lot of HP, this thing feels like chancy light. Flareon, on the other hand, gets a lot of attack, and Jolteon, of course, gets a lot of speed. And that's where I should note that in Generation 1, the Pokémon's chance to get a critical hit is determined by their base speed, so Jolteon has just over a 25% chance to get a critical hit, whereas both Flareon and Vaporeon have about half this, with a 12.5% chance to crit. Honestly, of the three for a solo playthrough, I'd say that Jolteon's stats are the weakest, and that's because the opponents don't have any stat experience, and also you get a badge which boosts your speed speed stat. Jolteon is just going to outspeed everything, and all of those excess stat points are just going to go to waste. After all, you really only need one more speed than your opponent. Like, yes, the higher crit rate is nice, and I'm sure we'll see that come into play throughout this playthrough. However, I'd really rather have more attack than just so much overkill in the speed stat. Whereas Vaporeon and Flareon can make up for their speed deficit with things like the badge boost glitch. For a solo playthrough, I think that Flareon sort of has the best stats because it has really high attack and really high special, meaning all of its attacks are going to hit very hard. However, in Generation 1, the fire type is not particularly good, so I think that its base 65 HP and 65 speed might end up being a liability just because of its typing. Of course, Vaporeon's stats are incredible. The only downside is its attack stat, which is pretty low. That means that specifically moves like Quick Attack, Bite, and Body Slam are not going to hit very hard. Luckily for it though, it has fantastic special moves. It starts the game off with Water Gun. And then through TMs and HMs, it gets access to Bubble Beam, Ice Beam, Blizzard, and Surf. An interesting quirk about its level up learn set is the fact that it learns Haze and Mist at the exact same level. I believe in all of Generation 1, Vaporeon is the only Pokemon that learns two moves at the same level. And it can only do so in Pokemon Yellow if it's in the daycare when it levels up. If it's leveling up in a battle just regularly, it'll actually skip Haze entirely. This is uh, such a weird quirk. I love Generation 1. Things like this are just so awesome. Anyways, that's just a neat piece of trivia because I don't think I'll be using either Haze or Mist today. But I'll probably be using Acid Armor. After all, the defense stat is Vaporeon's weakest stat, and Acid Armor boosts it by two stages. It also triggers the badge boost glitch to improve all of Vaporeon's other stats. The only downside though is that Vaporeon's going to need to be level 47, and I'll probably be around Giovanni by that point in the game. Flareon's move pool is very similar. It starts with Ember, a same type attack bonus move, and it also gets Quick Attack, which is great because then it can utilize its high attack stat. Through level up, it gets Bite, and then Fire Spin and Flamethrower. Now, Fire Spin isn't very useful just because it has 70% accuracy, but Flamethrower is basically the best fire type move in the game, and it's so nice that Flareon gets it. However, it does have to be level 52. Notably absent from its level up learn set is a badge boosting move. However, through TMs and HMs, it gets access to the four standard normal type moves, Body Slam, Tape Down, Double Edge, and Hyper Beam, all of which are going to hit super hard with base 130 attack. You might think that Skull Bash would be an option to badge boost because it raises the user's defense, but uh, it doesn't actually do that in Generation 1. It just like takes a turn and does nothing on the first turn and then attacks on the second turn. So no badge boosts there. Jolteon has a similar starting set. Again, Quick Attack, 
Attack and Thundershock. And then through Level Up, it has the most diverse moves. Double Kick, which is a fighting type move, Pin Missile, which is a bug move, and then Agility, which is a psychic move and also can trigger the badge boost. Through TMs and HMs, it gets access to the standard normal type moves, and then it gets access to Thunderbolt. I find it very strange that Jolteon doesn't learn Thunderbolt through Level Up. The only Pokemon that learns this move through Level Up in Generation 1 is Pikachu, and only in Yellow version. So strange. Anyways, getting back to the evolutions, they all share the same growth rate, which is a medium fast growth rate. So that's the conclusion to the comparison, and now I need to make a prediction. I think that Vaporeon is clearly the favorite here. Throughout all the playthroughs I've done of Pokemon Yellow, fire types and electric types have really struggled, whereas water types tend to excel. However, it is very typical for water types to get walled at the very end of the game with the champion, especially because his Magneton or Jolteon are very intimidating foes to go up against. However, even with that, I think that Vaporeon is going to be the fastest today. I made a community poll to see what all of you would think, and after receiving around 11,000 votes, Vaporeon was in the lead with 65% of the votes. You also all think that Jolteon is going to be in second place, with Flareon being a distant third place. Only 4% of people said that it was going to be the fastest. And honestly, in recent times, Flareon is definitely the weakest evolution. Like, after the physical special split, this thing really didn't have anything going for it. However, I make these videos for a reason, and that's because sometimes surprising results occur. So, let's get into the playthroughs and figure out which evolution is the fastest in a playthrough of Pokemon Yellow. So, let's start things off with Vaporeon. After all, we all think it's going to do the best. When I'm filming these versus videos, I have to choose a play order. After all, the third Pokemon that I play, I'll play with the most experience, and the first Pokemon I play, I'll have no experience. So to balance things out a little bit, I tend to play the Pokemon that I think is going to do the best first. After all, if I can still perform better with it when I had less experience than the other two Pokemon, then I think that that shows that this Pokemon is much better. Also, I used to alternate between sections of the game, so I'd play like the first section of the game with Vaporeon, then with Flareon, then with Jolteon, but I streamed these playthroughs on Twitch, so I played them all unbroken. I also played them all in a single day, so no Pokemon got like the chance for me to like reflect on it, sleep on it, and then wake up and try again. I asked my chat what a good nickname for Vaporeon would be, and they suggested River, which I just think is like the cutest nickname for this thing. Okay, time to look at its back sprite. Hmm, not very good. I don't really like this one. It kind of looks like a flower. Anyways, Vaporeon takes an easy victory over the rival, and with that I'm off on my journey. And this first portion of the game is going to go by very quickly because Vaporeon's going to get by Brock on minimum battles. After all, his rock ground types take four times damage from water moves. And uh, yeah, Vaporeon gets the same type attack bonus with Water Gun already, taking its base 40 power up to an effective power of 60. After I defeat the Mandatory Trainer in Viridian Forest, Vaporeon is only level 6, but this should be enough to defeat Brock, so let's do it. Brock leads with Geodude, and honestly, this thing is so slow. Like, Vaporeon only has 14 speed, but it still moves first, hits Water Gun for 4 times damage, and knocks the rock out in a single hit. This gives it enough experience to level up to level 8, where it can learn Sand Attack. Now, this move could be useful, so I'll teach it in the place of Tail Whip. After all, I'm not going to need to lower any Pokemon's defenses. Next is Onix. It outspeeds using Screech, but that doesn't matter because I hit it with Water Gun right after and take it out in a single hit. So Vaporeon clocks in with a time of 3 minutes and 20 seconds in its Brock split. Honestly, a fantastic result. Now, can Flareon match that speed against the first gym leader? And instinctually, it should seem like Flareon is at a huge disadvantage here. After all, both ground and rock types are super effective against fire types. Also, the rock type resists fire. But the thing is, it doesn't really in Generation 1, because all rock Pokemon have such low special stats that fire moves actually end up doing a lot of damage to them. For Flareon, I asked my chat what a good nickname would be, and uh, they said Floof. And I was like, yes, Floof. Look at it. It has a little floof of hair on its head and like a little like floof scarf and then like a floofy tail so definitely floof 
perfect nickname. Also, all my nicknames need to be the same number of characters, just because it takes time to render characters on screen, and it would give a Pokemon a disadvantage if they had a longer nickname. Okay, chance to see its back sprite. Actually, I really like this one. I don't know why, it's just how like its tail curls up. I think it's really cute. Flareon also has no problems with the rival here, and with that, I'm off towards Viridian Forest. Now in here, I have a choice to make, which is do I fight additional bug catchers for more levels before Brock? And I think the right choice is to fight them. After all, I have super effective damage with Ember against all the bugs, so these fights end up being quite fast. Remember that these are my initial preliminary playthroughs, and I'm not actually going to rank the Pokemon based on these results. A lot of you were upset with how badly I played with Arcanine, and they were like, this is unfair. It's actually not unfair at all because I used the final playthrough's results after I've done optimization. These first playthroughs are to feel things out and see how the Pokemon can do, as well as identify all the major obstacles that each Pokemon faces. So by defeating all three bug catchers in Viridian Forest, Flareon is now level 10. By the way, in Pokemon games, the damage calculation rounds down whenever it does multiplication or division. This means that Pokemon actually get asymmetrical boosts to their damage when they level up. So for instance, Flareon is dealing much more damage at level 10 than it would be at level 9. I'll refer to this as damage rounding in the future. There isn't a lot of good documentation for it online, but if you look up the damage calculations and run the numbers yourself, you'll notice that Pokemon get big increases to their damage when they're at levels that end in 0, 3, 5, and 8. So with that explained, let's take on Brock. He leads with Geodude, and Flareon goes for Ember. Obviously it's not very effective, but it still does about a quarter. I go for Ember again, it takes Geodude down to orange, it strikes back with Tackle, and it looks like I might actually knock it out on the next hit. Oh, well I do because I got a critical hit. Alright, that's nice. Flareon levels up to level 11, and now it's time for Brock's ace, Onyx. I go for Ember, and it looks like this one is going to be a 4 hit. But after taking it to half, Onyx goes for Bide, and in this case I can use Sand Attack to stall it out, so I'm not doing any damage, it's not accumulating any damage, as a result Bide does nothing, and then I can strike back with Ember. And in this case I actually burn Brock's Onyx. This would be useful if the fight was going to take longer, but I just knock it out on the next turn. By the way, in Generation 1, if you cut the opponent's attack stat with Burn, and then they use a full heal, it will actually not restore their attack stat to its full value. So Flareon clocks in with a Brock split of 4 minutes and 9 seconds. That's roughly 50 seconds slower than Vaporeon, but by no means is it a bad first split. After all, Brock is known for delaying most Pokemon. And I don't have good news for any Jolteon fans out there. Actually, Jolteon is my favorite evolution, so bad news for me too. Because this thing is going to have to beat Brock with Quick Attack. Granted, it does have access to Tail Whip. This can help soften up Brock's rocks, and then I get Sand Attack at level 8. Potentially by starting with Sand Attack and then using Tail Whip, Jolteon has a path to victory at a low-ish level, like I'm thinking maybe level 10 or level 13. First of all, I nicknamed my Jolteon Punko because uh, it's basically like a punk rock dog, and then I face the rival in the lab. Okay, this back sprite is not great. It makes Jolteon's head look like it's really big. Like Jolteon's head needs to be like at least half that size. At least the rival's easy. And with that, now I have to make some decisions about how I want to train. I think what makes most sense is mirroring Flareon's route through the forest, fighting the bug catchers to get experience. After all, this yielded level 10 by the end of the forest, and I think that that's going to be perfect for Jolteon. Now it might seem scary to fight Brock at level 10, but I think with Sand Attack there is a clear path to victory here, and it would be nice to defeat him at a lowish level if it's possible. After all, then Jolteon isn't going into the rest of the playthrough with a major disadvantage. So let's see how this electric type can do. First, I have to go up against the Geodude. I'm going to start this fight off by setting up Sand Attack six times to minimize the chance the Geodude actually hits Jolteon. Unfortunately for me, Tackle lands a total of three times while I set up Sand Attack. Like, I feel like that was kind of unlucky. Then I start using Tail Whip to lower Geodude's defense, and it gets another Tackle in. Ah, oh, and another one? Are you kidding me? So Jolteon only has 11 hit points left for the rest of the fight. Because things were getting kind of close here, I decided to try Quick Attack and see how much damage it's doing and like, oh it is not doing very much damage. This is very bad. So I think that Jolteon is going to need level 13 to get a big boost to its damage ranges. The bad luck continues and Jolteon gets hit two more times, taking it all the way down to one hit point before I finally knock out the Geodude. But because Onyx hasn't had its accuracy lowered yet, it just knocks me out right away with Tackle. So the first thing that I can do to get more experience is fight the junior trainer in Brock's gym. 
Once I defeat him, this brings Jolteon up to level 11. While I was grinding, I was really thinking that maybe Sand Attack has more potential, and I just got very unlucky in that last fight, so I actually discontinued training a little bit early to try Brock again at level 12. While this isn't ideal for damage rounding, at least I have more HP, and I think that I'm going to get more lucky with my Sand Attacks. And this time Jolteon does get much more lucky, because it makes it by the Geodude with orange health remaining. However, that's still not the situation that I would like going into the Onyx. I make a misclick here and I use Thundershock against it, like, ugh. I was obviously trying to get to Sand Attack, not Thundershock. Still, the Onyx goes for Bide fairly soon, which gives me a bunch of free Sand Attacks, lowering its accuracy so much. Alright, that's perfect. However, then it hits with a Bind, taking Jolteon down to red health. And then immediately after that, it hits with another Bind and knocks Jolteon out. Okay, I'm going back to the wild, I'm going to level up to 13, and then I'm going to try this again. Here, everyone who's listening in the background, I just want you to glance over at the screen and, like, look at the Geodude. This time, it's just completely incompetent. It doesn't even do more than a quarter damage to Jolteon before I knock it out. So that is the luck that I was looking for in the previous two fights. And then this luck continues because the Onyx does not hit me once while I set up Sand Attack. Things continue to go well because as I start to use Tail Whip, it goes for Bide, giving me free Tail Whips, lowering its defense even further. I set up completely, and just before I start using Quick Attack, I get hit by Tackle for the first time, and it uh, only does 3 damage. So, it looks like Jolteon's got this one, even though it's doing very little to Onyx. Alright, things could turn around if it hits like a critical hit with Bind or something like that, but in this case, it just keeps missing, and Jolteon knocks it out. That earns the Punk Rock Doggo a 9 minute and 43 second Brock split. So that's almost three times the amount of time that it took Vaporeon to get by Brock, and roughly two times the amount of time that it took Flareon to get by him. However, this isn't nearly as bad as it could have been. After all, it is a sub 10 minute time, so I think that Jolteon still has some potential. Also, there's a small time save here. Because I didn't use any of my Thundershocks against Brock, I don't actually have to heal in the Pewter City Center. I can just head immediately onto Route 3 and start fighting the trainers here. Today, I choose to face the Lass. By the way, she only has two Pokemon, whereas the Bug Catcher immediately south of me has four Pokemon. Even with the time that I have to spend to walk back to Pewter City and reset her position to get by her, it's still going to be faster than just fighting the Bug Catcher. In Mount Moon, I pick up the Rare Candy, and then I face the Super Nerd. He's really easy for Jolteon. And with that, I get to grab the Dome Fossil. Definitely the best Cantonian Fossil. After that, I take on Jesse and James. After defeating them, Jolteon's level 17, and this is fine because I'm going to take on Misty right away. And I think it makes sense to fight both of the optional trainers in her gym. After all, Thundershock is super effective against the water types here, so it's fast experience. With them out of the way, let's take Misty out. She leads with Staryu, and even at level 18, Jolteon has more speed than both of her Pokemon. I go for Thundershock, and it just barely doesn't knock her lead out. She strikes back with Water Gun, doing a little bit to me, and then I finish it off on the next turn. Okay, time for the Starmie. I go for Thundershock, it does about a third, Starmie strikes back with Water Gun, my next Thundershock takes it to Orange, and also gets Paralysis, which is perfect. Starmie gets a critical hit with Tackle, but it isn't enough, and I finish it off on the next turn. So while Brock was difficult, Misty was the complete opposite. But there's a bit of a speed bump in the road for Jolteon now, because yeah, the rival on Nugget Bridge is next, and guess who's on his team? It is the absolutely awful Sandshrew. Luckily, I'm going to be able to get to it consistently because I'm able to one-shot the Spearow with Thundershock. However, now I have to defeat the ground type. And I really just want to emphasize here how awful Sandshrew is on the rival's team. He starts with it in this fight, and then for the rest of the playthrough, this thing is going to be a constant nuisance for Jolteon. In this fight, the only thing that it can do to annoy me is survive my quick attacks and then use Sand Attack. Luckily, the first one misses, which is perfect, and then it looks like I get a good roll with my final quick attack, knocking it out in four hits only. Alright, that's perfect. With it out of the way, this fight is going to be much easier. I get a critical hit on the Rattata and knock it out in one turn, and then the Eevee is next, and while it does survive my second Thundershock, it's just using 
Growl, so I take it down on the next turn. Now normally most Pokemon make it through Nugget Bridge without any obstacles, but for Jolteon there is one obstacle. It's the mandatory hiker that I have to face who has Machop and Geodude. I still don't have a good move for this rock type because Jolteon learns Double Kick at level 30. In this case the best strategy to use against him is lowering his defenses with Tail Whip. I actually throw in one Sand Attack just to lower its accuracy as well. And then when I start using Quick Attack I'm doing enough damage that I'm able to knock it out in 5 turns. After that I save Bill and then I head south to Vermilion City. First of all, I have to defeat this rocket here, and one of you mentioned in my community poll that you thought that Jolteon learns Dig, and uh, no, it doesn't learn Dig. I can't really tell if uh, the evolutions are supposed to be like foxes or dogs or cats. It's like some mix between all of those. And all of those animals seem like they should be able to Dig. After all, both Vulpix and Growlithe can learn Dig, but why can't these Pokemon? If Jolteon could learn Dig, that would actually give it decent coverage, especially against Pokemon like the Sandshrew that I just faced. After all, the ground type does not resist ground type moves. Oh well, nothing we can do about it, let's head to the SSN. Here I pick up the TM for rest, and things actually get a little bit scary against the Sailor in front of it. I don't one-shot the Tentacool, then it uses Supersonic, confusing me, and then I hit myself, and it takes me all the way down to 23 hit points before I finally knock it out. Okay, star use next, luckily I'm not confused anymore, so I do knock it out in a single hit. And with that victory I earn myself the TM for rest, which is my favorite TM. After that I pick up the TM for Body Slam, and then I grab the Rare Candy. Now it's time to face the rival. For this fight I unfortunately forgot to teach Jolteon Body Slam. As a result I am going to have to quick attack my way through the Sandshrew again. However, of all the fights with the rival, this battle and the one in Pokemon Tower later on are the two that the Sandshrew is the least impactful in. In this case, I think it's because it has one additional move in the form of Slash. Its base speed is too low to always get a critical hit with this move, and that means that it has a 1 in 3 chance of using Sand Attack, which is perfect. Also, after I knock it out, there's only one Pokemon that follows, which is the Eevee, so there's less chance for him to mess me up. Whereas in the previous fight, there were two Pokemon after you get Sand Attacked into Oblivion, and uh, yeah, then the Rattata can just use Hyper Fang and do a lot of damage. So because this fight's easier, Jolteon takes the victory. And now, it's time to take on Surge. For this fight, I've taught Jolteon Thunder Wave, and I need to explain something here. In Generation 1, moves that have a secondary effect that causes a status condition cannot apply that status condition to Pokemon of the same type. So, for instance, Thundershock cannot paralyze Raichu, and Body Slam can't paralyze Eevee. However, when the status condition is the move's primary effect, it does work. So in this case, I can paralyze the Raichu, cutting its speed and hopefully its consistency. Still, it hits a Mega Kick and it does half to Jolteon. Oh no, that's not good. I misclick, accidentally using Thunder Wave again, which does nothing. Luckily Raichu's paralyzed. I go for Body Slam next, and it does more than half because Jolteon got a critical hit. Okay, that's perfect. Lieutenant Surge uses an X speed. In Generation 1, this resets the speed to its original value and then applies the stat modifier. That means that now Raichu is actually faster than Jolteon despite the paralysis, but it just misses a Mega Kick, and my next Body Slam gets another critical hit, knocking the Electric Mouse out. So, I guess that's the advantage of having a high base speed. It really helps Jolteon secure those critical hits and win this fight. So after the first three gyms, Jolteon clocks in with a time of 21 minutes and 46 seconds. And now let's switch back to Vaporeon and see how it can do in this section of the game. While Brock was easy, Misty and Surge could pose a threat for Vaporeon. After all, Misty is going to resist my water type attacks, and Vaporeon's attack stat is not particularly strong, and then Surge has super effective damage in the form of Thunderbolt. Also, one thing you'll notice is that as I'm defeating Jesse and James, Vaporeon is just not as high of a level as Jolteon, and that's because it didn't need to overlevel to face Brock. I did actually face some optional trainers in Mount Moon just to give Vaporeon a little bit more experience. After all, the hiker who has three rock ground types was basically free training. So I've made it to Cerulean City with Vaporeon and it's halfway through level 16. So I have a choice now. Do I face the rival on Nugget Bridge or do I face Misty? Well I think Misty is going to be the best option here and that's specifically because Vaporeon has a lot of HP. So I think that Bide actually has the potential to be an excellent strategy here. Let's see how it does. Misty leads with Staryu, and this thing is stuck using only Tackle, or potentially she could use an X Defend on it. As a result, I go for Bide first turn, I'm unfortunately not faster than the Starfish, it misses its next Tackle, and then hits me with a third Tackle getting a critical hit, and this allows Vaporeon to pay back damage. 
it takes her lead to orange health, and then I decide to knock it out with water gun. Like, I'm not sure if quick attack would do more damage, it probably would, but my attack stat's much lower, so either way I knock it out and I move on to the Starmie. It goes for Harden first turn, and then I start biting. After that it conveniently hits a critical hit with tackle, and then another tackle to follow that one up, and then when I unleash energy it does so much damage, taking Starmie all the way down to red health. In this case I go for Water Gun because it's set up with Harden, and I knock it out over two turns. The experience from this fight levels Vaporeon up to level 18 over a damage rounding threshold, and then Misty gives me the TM for Bubble Beam, which is the whole reason that I really wanted to prioritize this fight, because now Vaporeon is going to do much more damage, which will hopefully make more opponents one-shots, minimizing the amount of time that I need to spend in every battle. And the next one is the rival on Nugget Bridge. So with the same type attack bonus, Bubble Beam now has an effective power of 97.5, rounded up on my overlay to 98, and this allows it to one-shot the Spearow, one-shot the Sandshrew, one-shot the Rattata, and yes, the Eevee does survive, it has a lot of special after all. But I just knock it out on the next turn, and with that, I'm moving on. At the end of Nugget Bridge, there's a trainer that could be potentially risky for Vaporeon to face. She has two Oddish. However, in this case, I really want to draw your attention to the fact that Bubble Beam actually has a higher effective power than Quick Attack, even when it's not very effective. So yeah, I just beat both of the Oddish with two Bubble Beams each, and uh, yeah, easy victory! <laughs> so now Vaporeon's moving on towards Vermilion City. On the SSN, I pick up Body Slam and I teach it in the place of Bide. After all, Bide is only useful for Misty. In all my playthroughs, Bide is actually usually only useful against Misty. I also did use it when I played through with only an Eevee, because it's the only move that I had that could defeat the ghosts on Agatha's team. Now with Body Slam, I have improved normal type damage, so next I head to the room with Rest in it. After all, the Sailor is going to be easier to manage with this normal type move. I defeat the Gentleman, pick up the Rare Candy, and then I go up against the Rival. And uh, yeah, what do you expect? This fight goes exactly the same way the other fight went. A series of three one-hits, and then a two-hit on the Eevee. So up until this point, Vaporeon is making an incredibly fast time throughout the game. I'm arriving at Surge at 14 minutes and 30 seconds. However, Surge is a bit like Venomoth, he changes from day to day. So today with Vaporeon, I'm not sure if he's going to be a lieutenant, or as j -Rose says, a gift shop manager. Against him it makes most sense to use Bubble Beam because it's going to do a lot more damage than Body Slam. Looks like it's going to be a 3 hit, and uh, yeah, Surge just completely drops the ball, definitely gift shop manager today, and I knock Raichu out. So Vaporeon clocks in with a time of 14 minutes and 38 seconds. Yes, that fight only took 8 seconds. Now how will Flareon do in this section of the game? Because of the three, it definitely has the worst chances here. That's because being weak to Misty's water types is much more of a liability than being weak to Surge's single electric type that is very incompetent. After making it through Mount Moon, Flareon has the same amount of experience that Vaporeon had, and I didn't overlevel throughout this section of the game, specifically because I'm going to take on the rival on Nugget Bridge first, and gain a bunch more experience before I backtrack to face Misty. As this battle gets started, I just want to draw your attention to the Spearow's speed stat, which is 33. My Flareon has 32 speed. As a result, the bird moves first, uses Fury Attack, which gets a critical hit, and in Generation 1, every successive hit then does the same amount of damage. So, yeah, this does so much. It hits a total of four times, taking Flareon all the way down to orange health. That is not a good way to start this fight. I go for Ember, it does more than half to Spiro, it strikes back with Leer on the next turn, softening me up, and then I knock it out. Alright, I am not in good shape going into the fight against the Sand Shrew. Luckily, unlike Jolteon, I have special damage here, so I'm able to knock it out over two turns. However, I do get my accuracy lowered once with Sand Attack. Flareon levels up to level 17, and I move on to the Rattata. It has a low special stat, so I figured I'd go for Ember. But with Flareon's attack stat, it might have made more sense to use Quick Attack, I'm not sure. The Rat actually does significant damage with Tackle, probably because I sustained a Leer earlier on, and then I knock it out with Ember. So this fight is close. I hit Eevee with Ember, it does half because of a critical hit, and then the pre-evolution hits with Tackle, taking Flareon down to two hit points. Ah, uh, I think that's it. I use Ember, and in a stroke of incredible luck, it KOs because of a critical hit. I am so happy that Flareon pulled through there. After all, the first two splits are theoretically the worst for it in the entire game. 
However, there's a way to play around that, because after I save Bill, I can just fight the rocket outside of Cerulean City and make my way to the SSN right away. I'm bypassing Misty intentionally because I want to grab the TM for Body Slam, which will greatly improve Flareon's damage output. Now the next fight with Arrival is incredibly trivial. Body Slam just makes this so much easier. With him out of the way, I can use Dig, head back to Cerulean City, and now it's time to face Misty. So can the fire type do it? Let's see. First is Staryu, and because I'm overleveled, I'm gonna outspeed with Body Slam, and I knock it out in one hit. That's Flareon's attack stat for ya. So next is Starmie, and it outspeeds, which means when Misty uses an X Defend, it goes before Flareon. Yes, items follow the opponent's speed stat in Generation 1, it's very weird. So I was able to get a defense boost before I used Body Slam. Uh, but in this case, yeah, look at how much damage I do. I got a critical hit and knocked the Starmie out in one hit. So with that, Flareon has made it past the Water-type Master, and now I can head immediately back to Vermilion City and face Surge. One potential nuisance here is the fact that the Raichu can use Growl to lower your attack stat. In this case, Surge goes for an X speed on the first turn, which is absolutely useless because the Raichu is already faster than me. I hit with Body Slam, it does more than half, Raichu uses Thunderbolt, Flareon has a good special stat so it survives. Unfortunately, I get paralyzed, but because the Raichu was moving first, I get a chance to attack, I still move, hit Body Slam, and that's it. Flareon clocks in with a time of 15 minutes and 38 seconds. So we've reached that portion of the game where I want to compare these first three splits. Vaporeon is obviously in the lead with a time of 14 minutes and 38 seconds, and Flareon is in second place, trailing by only one minute. Yes, exactly one minute. However, Jolteon is in a distant third place. It's behind by seven minutes and six seconds at this point. However, there's still so much more of the game, and any of these Pokemon could run into a scary obstacle at some point. So it's definitely not over. Let's see how the next section of the game goes for Flareon. The first scary trainer for Flareon in the next section of the game is the first Pokemaniac inside of Rock Tunnel. The Cubone has super effective damage against me in the form of Bone Club, and then the Slowpoke resists my Fire-type moves. However, I can just use Body Slam here and knock it out. With him out of the way, it is time for the self-destructing hiker. It is Dudley himself. Yes, that is his name in Fire Red and Leaf Green. It is the perfect name for this guy. Now, Flareon actually has several strategies available to it here. The first one is I can use Ember to deal damage to the rock ground types. After all, they have low special stats. I've mentioned this a million times. So I am able to take them out quickly with this move. The other strategy that I could use is Sand Attack to lower their accuracy and then hope that they self-destruct. However, in this case, I do think that going for Ember is the better strategy. After all, if I get lucky and cut their attack, stat with a burn, then they will do less damage with self-destruct. The first one still blows up, doing almost half to Flareon. Alright, that's not a good start. The next one uses Rock Throw, which does a lot, taking me down to orange health. Okay, this is really not looking great. So because Rock Throw has such trash accuracy, I'm not going to lose to a tackle and Defense Girl does no damage, I figured that maybe this was the time to switch into Sand Attack strats and try and lower the Graveler's accuracy. But then it uses Self-Destruct, Connecting, and that knocks Flareon out. So that is the first reset for the Fire type. In the next fight, I decided to go for the Sand Attack strategy right away. Geodude hits a Rock Throw, then it hits a Tackle, and then it hits Self-Destruct. Like, ah, uh, this was just awful. I make it to the next Geodude. Luckily, this one misses its Self-Destruct, which is perfect, but uh, the Graveler doesn't miss its Self-Destruct, so Flareon goes down again. In the third fight, I make it back to the Graveler, but I have very low health. I go for Ember here, and I get so lucky because it burns Graveler. It goes for Defense Curl, takes some damage from Burn. I use another Ember. It isn't quite enough to finish it off. And then Graveler uses Self-Destruct and connects with Flareon. It does so much damage, but Flareon hangs on with two hit points. And that's it. So I've made it to Celadon City. Now at this point, I just want to mention some of the threats that are coming up in the late game for Flareon. It has to get by Giovanni, who has four Pokemon that know Earthquake. Also, the Rhydon has Rock Slide. Then it has to defeat Lorelei, who has mostly water types. And finally, it needs to get by Lance's Gyarados, which has Hydro Pump, and the champion Sand Slash that has Earthquake. As a result, I didn't think that it was smart to skip the hideout. After all, grabbing the extra rare candy here gives Flareon one more level, and I can also collect items and sell them, and then in the department store I can buy more vitamins. Today I decided to buy five Carbos for Flareon, because it has a low speed stat. If I can outspeed Lance's Gyarados with more than 108 speed, that would be ideal. But earlier on, I'd like to outspeed Koga's Venomoth with 104 speed. Now the place that makes sense to go next is Erika's gym. After all, there's lots of trainers in here. They're all closely clustered together, so you can fight them all very quickly. And this is going to give me a lot of experience. 
Something that I find really funny here though is that Body Slam is going to do more damage because Flareon is just like not very good with Ember. Ugh. Also these grass types have decent special stats and it's a combined stat in this generation. So after defeating all the trainers in the gym, I'm level 32. All right, let's try Erika. She leads with Tangela, and it has a high defense stat, so I go for Ember. I do half with my first hit, it strikes back with Bind, doing very little. Also, it's worth noting that I didn't heal going into this fight, I was so confident. I knock it out with my next Ember and move on to the Weepin' Bell. It's never going to use Razor Leaf, Sleep Powder, or Stun Spore because they're all Grass-type moves and she has good AI, so I know it's going to use Acid. I go for Body Slam, does more than half. Weepin' Bell strikes back with Acid, doing a decent amount to me, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, it's time for the Gloom. Body Slam does more than half, Acid doesn't knock me out, and as a result, Erika is defeated. With her out of the way, it's time for Pokemon Tower. The rival here is usually quite easy, and I actually make a mistake here by using Body Slam against the Fero. This means it can use Mirror Move and reflect Body Slam back at me and potentially paralyze Flareon. However, it doesn't. Okay, that's good, so I knock it out on the next turn. What I really should have done in that fight was used Bite instead, because it could have potentially flinched the Fero. Also, it can't flinch me if it uses Bite after I've moved. Ember also could have been a potential option, after all, it can't burn Flareon. However, after the Fero and the fact that I don't have Paralysis, the rest of his team is very easy, and I make it to the next Chandler. She's a bit scary for Flareon because Bite is a normal type move in Generation 1. The Gastlys are just like ultimate trolls, they have Lick, Confuse Ray, and Nightshade, just, ugh, it's the worst. I knock out the first one, so far so good, and then Ember gets a critical hit on the next one, so I made it through this fight on my first attempt. I defeat Jesse and James at the top of the tower, make my way through Cycling Road, complete the Safari Zone, and then I head to Koga's Gym next. After all, he has mostly bug types, and Flareon has decent special, so I figured that I would be able to go up against him now. However, it doesn't look like I'm going to get to the speed that I would have liked to have for his Venomoth. Well, it is what it is, let's take him on. He starts with three Venonats. Now they have lower special than they have defense, so I chose Ember here. It knocks the first one out in one hit with a critical hit, but the second one survives with orange health, uses Psybeam, doing very little, and then I knock it out. Okay, so far so good, I'm gonna get through the third Venonat for sure. Remember, Koga has good AI, so he can't use Sleep Powder in this case, which is perfect for me. The third Venonat goes for Double Edge, it actually does a lot. And then I went for Body Slam, hoping to knock it out, but it survives on just a sliver, and then it uses Toxic, poisoning Flareon. Uh, so this is really not the condition I want to face Venomoth in. After all, this thing is a ground water type, so it's really scary for Flareon. It outspeeds using Psychic, taking me all the way down to orange health. Flareon strikes back with Body Slam. It doesn't even get the Venomoth to orange health, and then it finishes me with Psychic on the next turn. Alright, so instead of fighting Koga, I'm gonna head to Sylph. Here I have to fight some more trainers, that takes Flareon up to level 38, and I also get access to some more vitamins. Now while I'm here, it makes sense to try and fight the rival to see how this fight will go. He leads with Sand Slash. The worst thing that it could do to me right now is use Sand Attack. I debated using my own to lower its accuracy, but in the end I decided against it. I go for Ember, it does more than half because of a critical hit, and then I knock it out on the next turn with another critical hit. There have been a lot of crits so far. Cloister's next, and here I want to draw your attention to a glitch in Generation 1, which is the fact that the message that is displayed when I hit it with a Fire-type move is incorrect. My moves are actually doing neutral damage because it's super effective against the Ice-type and not very effective against the Water-type, but the message that is displayed is the thing that's just an error. I knock it out with one Ember, a Fire Spin, and then another Ember, and I move on to the Magneton. Two Body Slams do the trick, Kadabra is just barely outspeeding, but it just goes for Recover doing nothing and I knock it out, and now it's time for Flareon vs Flareon. I'll just mention here that yes, Vaporeon would be harder for Flareon to face, but I'm trying to see how fast these Pokemon can play through the game, and it's a little bit weird how I would get the rival to pick Vaporeon, because I would have had to lose in the battle in the lab, and then I would be intentionally making a choice that would not favor Flareon's final results. That just doesn't seem like it makes sense when I'm trying to get the best possible time with Flareon, and of all of the three, I think that Flareon is the underdog, so I didn't want to put it at a disadvantage. With the rival of the way, I complete Sylph, defeating Jesse and James and Giovanni, and then I do some errands. I pick up the TM for Swift, after all, all the evolutions can learn it, and then I pick up the TM for Mimic, after all, this move is fantastic in the late game. Because I'm currently in Saffron City, and Flareon has a good attack stat, I figured, why not face Sabrina?
Now I wanted to implement a bit of a silly strategy here, which is if I just spam sand attack over and over again, the Abra might actually land flashes against me, which would badge boost my attack stat. I was thinking that then if it badge boosted me enough, I could use Swift to knock out the rest of her Pokemon, but uh, yeah, my sand attacks are just very effective. Abra doesn't land a single flash, and as a result, I just knock it out with Body Slam. Okay, time for the Kadabra. It moves first with Psy Wave, which doesn't do very much, and then my Body Slam doesn't get the knockout. Kadabra strikes back with Psychic, taking Flareon down to orange health, and then I knock it out. Okay, time for her ace, Alakazam. It goes for Reflect first turn, and my Body Slam does about a third. It might even take four hits to knock it out at this range, but that doesn't even matter because Alakazam uses Psychic and knocks Flareon out. In the next fight, I realized what the solution was for the Abra. Instead of spamming Sand Attack against it, why don't I just use Ember? After all, once it hits me with Flash a few times, then Flareon is going to stop doing damage altogether. This lets me badge boost my attack stat up to 308, and then I use Swift, knock the Abra out, next is Kadabra, Sabrina moves first using an X-Defend, I almost knock it out, it gets a big Psy Wave, and then I take it down. Alright, I'm not in a great position against the Alakazam. I think at this point I've realized that just spamming Body Slam is the way to go. Still, Sabrina can be pretty bad, she misses a Psy Wave, and then her next Psy Wave does very little damage, and so Flareon takes the victory anyways. Now I can't use Surf until I have Koga's badge, so it just makes sense to go and try and face him now. Hopefully this will go better than last time. He leads with Venonat, and unfortunately at this level, Ember isn't enough to get the one hit. As a result, my special gets lowered, and now it definitely makes sense to use Body Slam. After all, the special drop did increase my attack with the badge boost. I critical hit the next Venonat, knocking it out in one turn, but the third one survives, hits a decent double edge, and then I take it down. Last is Venomoth. It goes for Psychic, which takes Flareon to the red, and also drops my special again. Ah, uh, this is really frustrating. I go for Body Slam, and here Luck comes through and helps me out. I paralyze the Venomoth, move first against it on the next turn, and with that, Flareon clocks in. It gets a time of 38 minutes and 21 seconds. Now, can Jolteon regain some of the time that it lost in the early portions of the game throughout the mid-game? Well, the prognosis is not looking good, because right after Surge, it has to face the Wrapping Lass. She has four Grass-type Pokémon, and with Jolteon's low attack stat, things do not look particularly good against her. The main reason I mention her in most of my videos is the fact that she can paralyze you with Stun Spore, cut your speed, and then the following Bellsprout can just go to town with Wrap. Today, Jolteon does get paralyzed. What's very interesting here is that its speed stat was so good that it's almost outspeeding the Bellsprout, even with Paralysis. Yes, the Bellsprout here only have one more speed than Jolteon. Also, I'll explain a glitch that occurs here. When Bellsprout goes for growth, it cuts my Jolteon's speed again. This is because when the opponent uses a move that boosts their stats, the Paralysis speed cut is reapplied to the other Pokémon. This is incredibly weird, but yeah, that's the way it works. And this effect can be stacked, so much so that Jolteon's speed drops all the way down to 1. So for instance, if you wanted to use this glitch in your own playthrough of Generation, one, you would paralyze the opponent's Pokémon and then use a move like Swords Dance to further cut their speed. However, in most cases, this isn't useful tactically. That's because after your speed has been cut with Paralysis, you're usually moving second anyways. However, you can use this glitch with Burn to drop the opponent's attack stat all the way down to 1, so that might be more useful. I hope one day in these playthroughs that I will find a way to use that glitch. Still, even with the status condition in this fight, Jolteon does manage to take a victory on its first attempt. And you'd really hope that things would be easier from here, but nope, I gotta get through the Cubone first. It takes about a third damage from Body Slam. Luckily, I paralyzed it. I don't entirely avoid Bone Club, though. It hits me with one, taking Jolteon down to around half before I move on to the Slowpoke. But luckily against it, I have super effective damage in the form of Thunderbolt, and I knock it out in one hit. And all of that brings me to the self-destructing hiker, and oh no, I forgot to heal for this fight. Ugh, that's really bad. Okay, Sand Attack has to come through for me here, because Jolteon, unlike Flareon, does not have an alternative strategy for this fight. The first Geodude uses Self-Destruct, and it hits, which takes Jolteon all the way down to 11 hit points. Alright, I'm really not liking my chances in this one. But then I get 5 uses of Sand Attack in on the next Geodude, and it self-destructs and doesn't hit. Okay, that's perfect, I've made it to the Graveler. I'm lucky here that Jolteon's outspeeding, it uses Sand Attack, lowering Graveler's accuracy once, and then it goes for Self-Destruct. But it misses, and Jolteon takes the win. 
All right, that's really exciting. Maybe that's the luck that Jolteon needs to start catching up. Mirroring the approach to the mid game that I took with Flareon, I am also going to explore the rocket hideout to collect items and grab the final rare candy. I can also pick up Double Edge on my way, which might be useful for Jolteon if it's struggling with damage ranges with Body Slam. When I defeat the trainer just in front of this TM, Jolteon levels up to level 30, and at this level it can now learn Double Kick, so that's going to be my answer to rock ground types from here on out. In the department store, after selling all the items that I collected, I have enough money to buy 5 vitamins, and today I go for 5 calcium. This stat is used both offensively and defensively, so using these vitamins to improve this stat has a double effect, which is really nice. Unlike Flareon, I head to Pokemon Tower next, because I don't really want to fight Erika, after all grass types resist electric type moves. The rival here is incredibly easy, Thunderbolt one shots the Fero, Thunderbolt two shots the Magnemite, like I could have switched to Body Slam, but it probably would have just two hit anyways. I want to hit the Shelter, and then I have to use Body Slam to two hit the Sandshrew. Again, this is the last fight in which this thing is not going to be a problem. And then finally, I one shot the Eevee with Thunderbolt. Jolteon has an advantage over Flareon here because it doesn't have to worry against the first Chandler with two Ghastly. I can just one shot both of them with Thunderbolt. And after that, I'm ready to explore Cycling Road and the Safari Zone. The vitamins in here are unfortunately not very good for Jolteon. I get a car Carbos, which raises my already ridiculous speed, like Jolteon with 104 speed already has more speed than Koga's Venomoth. The second vitamin of course is a protein, and like yeah it's nice to have more attack, but I really would have preferred to increase my special. Now that I've collected the mandatory items, I have to make a choice. Do I face Koga, do I face Erika, or do I go to Sylph? And in this case, for Jolteon, I think it makes sense to go to Sylph next. This gives me an additional Carbos, an additional Calcium, experience from two trainers, and finally a Protein. After all that, Jolteon is level 33 over a damage rounding threshold. To prevent backtracking and hopefully save some time, let's face the rival and see if it's possible. Now remember when I said the Sandshrew was going to become problematic? Yeah, now it's a Sand Slash, and it's terrifying. Luckily though, it doesn't have any ground type moves yet. I go for Body Slam because it's going to do the most damage and uh, oh no. All hope is lost now. I am definitely not going to be able to win here. I do defeat the Sand Slash, knock the Cloister out, but then the Magneton just polishes me off. Here's the thing though, Jolteon learns Pin Missile at level 36, and this is a bug type move. If you didn't know in generation 1, bug type moves are super effective against both grass and poison types, meaning this move will deal 4 times damage to 2 of Erika's Pokemon, as well as all of the Pokemon in Erika's gym. So I use 2 rare candies leveling Jolteon up to level 36, and I learned this move in the play of Thunder Wave. With it, I defeat a bunch of the trainers in Erika's gym for levels, and then I take her on. She leaves with Tangela. Now, Pin Missile is super effective here, but it only does two times damage. My first turn gets a five hit, which is awesome. It does more than half to the Tangela. It goes for Constrict, doesn't lower my speed, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, time for the Weeping Bell. And here you can see four times damage, also with a crit. So yeah, Weeping Bell goes down with ease, Gloom is last, and I have more than enough damage to take it out in only one turn. So because bug moves are super effective against psychic types, I don't want to go back to Sylph just yet. I'm instead going to go to Koga's gym because I can defeat the two mandatory jugglers here. Their teams are exclusively psychic types. By doing this, Jolteon is almost level 40. So to be over the damage rounding threshold, I head back to this trainer at the beginning of the gym. I very rarely fight this guy, and I figured he would be easy experience. And uh, yeah, then the drowsy knocks Jolteon out. Uh, so that's a little frustrating. I have to refight this juggler, and then I go back to this guy and fight him for a second time. I get better luck here and polish his psychic types off, leveling Jolteon up to level 40. Now it's time for Koga. Now, Bug doesn't resist Bug, however, Thunderbolt is just way better as a choice here. I get the same type attack bonus and the Venonats have low special. I knock the first one out in one hit, but the second one just barely survives. I paralyze it, I use Psybeam, which does so little. Alright, good. I hit the next one, but then it goes for Sleep Powder. Mmm, that's not good. It starts hitting with Psychic, and it lowers Jolteon's special before it wakes up. That's really not good. I do manage to finish it off and move on to the Venomoth, but my hopes are not high now. I go for Thunderbolt, it does like, oh, maybe a quarter, that's really not good. Because Venomoth set up with double team, I miss my next Thunderbolt, it hits a Leech Life, and my next Thunderbolt takes it to half. But then Jolteon's high base speed comes into the rescue, and it gets a critical hit, allowing me to bypass the negative stat changes and knock the Venomoth out on my next hit. So Jolteon gets a 40 minute and 59 second Koga split. So let's head back over and check in on Vaporeon. Now in the segment between Cerulean City and Celadon City, Vaporeon is going to struggle against a lot less trainers. There are only actually two potential candidates that could wall it. 
The first one of course being the Wrapping Lass, and that's because my attack stat is too low to one-shot her Oddish with Body Slam, but junior trainers don't have good AI assigned to them, so her Pokemon are just choosing moves randomly. In this case, the Oddish chooses Absorb, so I knock the first one out, and then against the second one, I paralyze it with Body Slam. This doesn't stop it from moving, but it just uses Absorb again, so yeah, Vaporeon gets a win here. And from there, things are significantly easier. I make my way into Celadon City, and here I have a choice. Do I go to the hideout, or do I go to the department store? And I think in this case, it just makes sense to skip the hideout entirely, just because of how good Vaporeon is. In the department store, I pick up the TM for Ice Beam, which I teach to Vaporeon right away, and I also buy 3 Calcium. After all, I can afford less because I didn't go to the hideout and collect high-priced items. Now, I could have chosen to go to Erica next, but I decided that this was a little bit risky. It makes more sense to get as many levels as possible with Vaporeon before taking on the Grass-type leader. Instead, I'll head to Pokemon Tower and defeat the rival here. I bet that Ice Beam was going to one-shot the Fero. In this case, it does because of a critical hit, so that's good. It could have used Mirror Move and frozen Vaporeon, but that didn't happen today. After that, I start using Bubble Beam because it has a slightly higher effective power than Ice Beam when it's not resisted. And yeah, the rest of the rival's team is very easy, as is usually expected in this fight. Okay, so it's time for the fight against the Chandler with two Ghastly. With Bubble Beam, Vaporeon isn't one-hitting, which exposes it to tactics like Lick and Confuse Ray, but in this case, I get lucky and defeat both of our Pokemon without an issue. With all these Pokemon, I've been collecting the items on Cycling Road. After that, I go into the Safari Zone, grab the mandatory items, and then I head to Erica's Gym. Since I have a super effective move in the form of Ice Beam, I don't think that I actually need much more training to defeat her. Also, I have such high hopes for Vaporeon, and I really believe in it, that I'm not going to do any additional training. So I defeat the one mandatory trainer, and then I go up against Erica. Her first Pokemon's Tangela, and in this case, Ice Beam actually knocks it out in a single hit, because I got a lucky critical hit. Next is Weepin Bell. I score another critical hit against this thing, like what? And then finally against Gloom, my Ice Beam doesn't get the KO, but in this case it gets a freeze. Like, are you kidding me? This has to be one of the luckiest fights. I just want to mention now that there are so many ways that fight could have gone wrong, because if I didn't one-hit the Weepin' Bell or freeze the Gloom, they both could have used Sleep Powder against Vaporeon, and the Tangela also would have hit with moves like Mega Drain or Vine Whip to deal a lot of damage to me. That's because she does have good AI, so she knows to prioritize her grass moves over all of her other moves. Well, at least for now Vaporeon is proceeding. I'll have to figure out in my next playthrough how to get through that fight consistently. Next I head to Sylph, and at this portion of the game I want you to just look down and check out the experience bar. I am level 32. After I defeat the Machoke Trainer, I am almost level 33. I pick up some vitamins, and then after I defeat the Arbok Trainer and grab the card key, Vaporeon is level 33, so that's over a damage rounding threshold. So let's try to take on the rival now. He leads with Sand Slash, and in this case it is so refreshing to know that I'm probably going to one-shot this thing. After all, I was just in the Safari Zone, so now Vaporeon has Surf. It takes the Sand Slash down in a single hit, and up next is the Cloister. Now unfortunately, I don't have a move that's particularly good here. If you didn't already know, Cloister has the highest base defense of any Pokemon in the game. Like, its defense stat in this fight is 136, whereas its special stat is 70. So, using Surf against it actually makes sense, just because this is a special move. Also, there's another advantage that Vaporeon here has against this thing, which is the Cloister's moveset. It has Withdraw, Supersonic, Clamp, and Aurora Beam. And in this case, the rival has good AI, which means he's going to deprioritize all of his water and ice moves, because Vaporeon resists them. So, the only thing the Cloister can do to me is use Supersonic, which is really bad. It's so inaccurate, and Vaporeon has so much health and a low enough attack stat that it won't do very much damage to itself anyways. I finish the Cloister off, and now I move on to the Magneton. And I'm really hoping I do enough damage to two-hit it, because it doesn't resist Surf. However, Vaporeon hits itself in confusion on the first turn, Magneton uses Thundershock, and it actually doesn't do as much as I was expecting, just takes Vaporeon down under half. I go for Surf, it does what looks like almost half, Magneton takes me to red health, I take it to red health, and then it finishes Vaporeon with Thundershock. So that is my first reset. Here's the thing, Vaporeon is going to be so strong in the late game with moves like Blizzard and Surf, that I can probably just use my rare candies now to take it up to a higher level and then reattempt the rival without any backtracking. So if I use 5 rare candies, then Vaporeon's going to be level 38 over 2 more damage rounding thresholds. Let's try this level. 
Obviously I'm still one-shotting the Sand Slash, but now I can three-shot the Cloister, which is more consistent. Next is Magneton. Once again, Vaporeon hits itself in confusion. Ah, are you kidding me? Magneton goes for Thundershock. It does a decent amount. I snap out of confusion, hit Surf, it does more than half. Thundershock hits again, taking me to orange and unfortunately it paralyzes me. So Magneton gets in another Thundershock, taking Vaporeon to red before I finally knock it out. Kadabra's next, obviously Body Slam is the correct choice here. It actually just fails to recover and then I knock, oh, it survives on red health, are you kidding me? But I get paralysis, it fails to move and I knock it out on the next turn anyways. Okay, so all that's left here is Flareon. Once again, like I said before, it doesn't make sense to fight the rival on Route 22 at the beginning of the game, so that's why he doesn't have Jolteon in this fight. Unfortunately for me, it moves faster, hits Bite, taking Vaporeon down to 9 hit points, and then Paralysis makes it so that I don't move. Flareon hits a follow-up Bite, and with that, Vaporeon goes down, getting its second reset. That fight was lost because of Paralysis, so I attempt again. However, in this case, Confusion gets even worse against the Magneton, and it takes me all the way down to red health before the Cadaver comes out, and I yeah, then it just knocks me out with Psybeam. So that's Vaporeon's third reset. Now whenever I use rare candies, I always use them after I save in case I decide that I don't want to use them. So in this case, maybe let's not use the rare candies and instead let's go to Koga's gym and polish off some more mandatory trainers. After all, there are two jugglers in this gym that have six Pokemon in total. By defeating them, it takes Vaporeon all the way up to level 36 and let's just try Koga at this level and see how it goes. After all, I am outspeeding all the Venonats. The risk here is the fact that the first and third Venonat know Sleep Powder. I don't one hit the first one, so it tries to go for it, but it fails and I knock it out on the next turn. So the second Venonat is less scary because it doesn't have Sleep Powder and I just get a critical hit with Surf anyways. Okay, time for the third Venonat and its Sleep Powder works. It goes for Double Edge doing about a fifth. Vaporeon wakes up, it hits Psychic getting a critical hit and lowering my special. That is not nice. I take it out on the next turn and move on to the Venomoth, but I'm not really liking my position in this battle. Venomoth goes for Leech Life, taking Vaporeon to half. I strike back with Surf, and it does like almost no damage, like maybe a fifth. That's so bad. On the next turn, Venomoth goes for Psychic, which does so much and again lowers my special, so my follow-up Surf does even less. As a result, Venomoth knocks Vaporeon out, and that's my fourth reset. All right, so Vaporeon is starting to get walled here. Let's go back to Sylph. I can use four rare candies now, so slightly less, and get to level 40, which is over another damage rounding threshold for this fight. I also figured out that I can play around the Cloister by using Sand Attack. After all, Supersonic is so inaccurate, and Sand Attack buys time for Confusion to wear off, so that when I get to the Magneton, I'm not going to be hitting myself, and I can knock it out with two turns of Surf. That leaves me with more health left over from the Cadaver, I tank its Psybeam, even though it does confuse me, and then once again, Body Slam doesn't get the one hit. Like, what? <laughs> Come on! It hits another Psybeam, Vaporeon snaps out of confusion, and knocks it out with Body Slam. Alright, all that's left is the Flareon, and because I'm not paralyzed here, I move first, hit with Surf, and knock it out. So finally, Vaporeon is past this awful stage of the game. I'm quite surprised that Vaporeon struggled here. I really thought that Surf and Ice Beam would just be enough to brute force my way through these fights. The reward for all of this is I get extra experience for the mandatory trainers of Jesse and James and then Giovanni. Oh, I forgot to heal for this fight. Well, Giovanni's pretty bad. This shouldn't be an issue. Surf one hits the Nidorino. I level up to level 42. Here's my chance to learn Haze. Um, yeah, I'll just forget Sand Attack. I probably won't need that move anymore anyways. Persian's next. It goes for Screech. And then I hit with Surf, knocking it out in one turn. Perfect. I knock the Rhyhorn out in one turn. And last is Nidoqueen. I go for Surf, and it also takes it down in one hit. Okay, perfect. Vaporeon is on a roll now. Let's head back to Koga and see if I can earn the right to use Surf outside of battle. Now at level 42, I one-shot the first Venonat, one-shot the second Venonat with a critical hit, I will admit, and then Vaporeon levels up to 43 over a damage rounding threshold, giving me more damage to one-hit the third Venonat. Oh, also assisted by a critical hit. So many critical hits. Venomoth's next, Koga uses an X attack. My Surf does about a third. Venomoth strikes back with Toxic, which is very useless because there's no way it's going to get very many more turns in this battle. Also, uh, my next Surf just crits, and that's three crits for this battle. And uh, yeah, I did it. Vaporeon clocks in with a 34-minute Koga split. It's usually at this point that we compare splits, and I'm going to do this, but I just want to make one clear caveat, which is the fact that we're comparing the Koga splits from Jolteon and Vaporeon to the Sabrina split that Flareon had, because it actually fought Sabrina and then Koga. This is essentially the fifth gym that all these Pokemon faced. So Vaporeon had a 34 minute time, it's still in the lead, like 
What would you expect? Flareon is in second place with a 37 minute and 29 second time, and Jolteon is in last with a 40 minute and 59 second time. So Jolteon is now 6 minutes and 59 seconds behind Vaporeon. And honestly that's pretty great because it has gained back some time. However, the road ahead for Vaporeon looks quite easy because the next gym leader that I need to defeat is Blaine, and after I defeat him and get the Volcano Badge, my special stat is going to get a badge boost. So I don't think I need any of the optional training in his gym, let's just take him on right away. Now I need to mention the fact that there is a chance that Vaporeon loses against Blaine. You're probably like, what? That doesn't make any sense. You might be remembering Blaine from Red and Blue. He is so bad in those games. But in Pokemon Yellow, I think he is one of the best gym leaders. I think he's actually tied for the best gym leader with Giovanni. I think Koga takes a uh, close second place to these two. The reason that I'm worried about Blaine is the fact that all of his Pokemon actually have strong normal type moves which do physical damage. Also, since his fire types have decent special stats, and they only take two times damage from Surf, I'm not knocking them out in one hit. Well, uh, the Rapidash does damage to itself with takedown and then I knock it out. Also, this is the one that has the lowest special stat of his entire team. However, I still only have orange health left over for the Arcanine. It sets up Reflect first turn, which is useless. My Surf takes it to orange, and then it goes for Fire Blast, which does burn me, but that's irrelevant, so I knock it out on the next turn with Surf, and Vaporeon does take a first attempt victory. So there's only two more gyms for Vaporeon. I have to take on Sabrina first. I stop by Copycat's house and pick up the TM for Mimic. Uh, she kind of trolls me and walks around the room and like traps me over here by this doll. Like, ah. Anyways, finally I get Mimic, and then I move on to Sabrina's gym. Now here Vaporeon's speed is starting to become a liability, because at level 44 I am not even outspeeding the Abra. It misses Flash, I hit Body Slam and luckily knock it out. Okay, that's perfect. Next is Kadabra, but it makes up for the failure of Abra, uses Kinesis right away and lowers Vaporeon's accuracy. I don't knock it out, Sabrina uses an X Defend, and my next Body Slam misses. Uh, Kadabra recovers health, and then Body Slam connects, and I get a lucky critical hit knocking it out. Alright, that's one way to do it. However, things take a turn south against the Alakazam because it sets up Reflect right away, so I am doing so little damage to it. I really think I should have switched into Surf as soon as it did that. As a result of this apparent misplay, I get knocked out by Psychic. Alright, so while I knew Vaporeon was going to be strong, I didn't actually anticipate this many resets before the League. But even with them, it's still getting an exceptional time. In the next fight against Sabrina, I get the luck I need, I knock the Alakazam out, and earn myself the 7th badge. And now, there's only one left, so I have to fight two mandatory trainers in Giovanni's gym. This takes Vaporeon up to level 45, and now I'm ready to face the last gym leader. Giovanni leads with Doug Trio, and there is no way that I outspeed this thing. I need 32 more speed to move first. It tries Fissure, but luckily misses. I hit with Surf, and knock it out in one hit. Okay, that is like the perfect opening, took no damage, moved on to the Persian. It sets up double team. Surf takes it to orange. It hits Slash, doing almost half to me. My Surf misses. It lowers my defense with Screech, and then I knock it out with Surf. So going into the Nidoqueen, I am not in a very good spot, because if any of Giovanni's remaining Pokemon hit me with an attack, I am most certainly going to go down just because of how low my defense is. Here's the thing though, Surf is super effective against his final three Pokemon, and it one-shots the Nidoqueen one-shots the Nidoking, and then before I move on to the Rhydon, I level up to 47 and get a chance to learn Acid Armor. Obviously Haze isn't going to be useful, it actually removes your badge boosts, so I just teach this move in that place. Rhydon's last, it's slow, I hit with Surf for 4 times damage and knock it out. So Vaporeon has completed the gym challenge with a time of 39 minutes and 8 seconds. That is an outstanding result, and this thing might be positioned to clock in under 50 minutes of total time. But there's still one more trainer before the leak, and uh, I'm not going to lie to you here, Vaporeon is going to have no issues against him. I can set up Acid Armor against the first Sand Slash, because it has like basically no good moves. After that I one hit the Sand Slash with Surf, one hit the Execute with Ice Beam, two hit the Cloister with Surf, it missed Supersonic in this case, and yes it can only use Supersonic here as well. After that I have to two shot the Magneton, I was worried about Thunder Wave here, but it just goes for Thundershock, dealing a little bit of damage, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Kadabra's next, it goes for a Recover, Body Slam does more than half, and then it uses Psy Beam, doing only a little, after all my special stat has been badge boosted, and then I just sweep through the Flareon with Surf. So Vaporeon is heading to the League at a time of 40 minutes and 15 seconds. 
Now of the three, Flareon has the best chance of catching up to Vaporeon in this section of the game. After all, it just defeated Koga, and it does resist Blaine's fire-type attacks, so I might as well head to Cinnabar Island next and try and get myself a special boost. Also, because I defeated Sabrina using Swift, I can teach Reflect in its place to give Flareon some play against Blaine's strong physical attacks. First turn against Ninetales, I set it up. It doesn't actually double my defense stat or cause a badge boost, so that's why you don't see my defense changing when I use it. Next, Ninetales uses Tail Whip, lowering my defense. That's kind of annoying. At least it badge boosts my other stats. And then Flareon knocks the Ninetales out over the next two turns with Body Slam. Rapidash is next. It goes for Fire Spin, trapping me because it's faster. By only six speed, actually. It follows this up with Takedown, but it misses. I get a Body Slam in, doing almost half. But my next one doesn't KO. It traps me in another Fire Spin, which is really annoying. Then it goes for Growl, lowering my attack. And I finally knock it out, but Flareon is not in a good position against the final Arcanine. I thought maybe using Sand Attack here to cut its consistency might be a good idea. After all, this thing does have Takedown and Fire Blast, both of which are not 100% accurate, and Reflect won't really do anything. But unfortunately, this doesn't end up working out and Flareon faints. So I tried this fight two more times, and both of them resulted in a loss. So I think Flareon is going to need some extra training. I fight the trainers in Blaine's gym to gain some experience, and then I knock out some wild Pokemon just to level up over the next damage rounding threshold to level 45. At this level I tried Blaine again. I'm using the same strategy to set up Reflect and then spam Body Slam, and I think I got luckier in this fight, and as a result Flareon takes the win. So the only gym leader that remains for it is now Giovanni. I fight only the two mandatory trainers in Giovanni's gym, and then I teach Flareon Mimic. This is going to be key for defeating Giovanni. After all, I take super effective damage from all his powerful ground type moves, the uh, earthquakes I mean, also dig from the Doug Trio, and I'm really going to need to mimic double team from the Persian in order to have any success here at all. I gamble with a first turn reflect, Giovanni just uses a guard spec so I get my setup off for free. Now with this move there are two potential plays. Number one, try to steal Earthquake from the Doug Trio, which is what I do in this fight. After all it will do more damage than Body Slam. Unfortunately for me though this doesn't play out well against the Doug Trio, I really should have used Earthquake against it to knock it out, but yeah it gets me this time. In the next fight I make it past the Doug Trio to the Persian, and then it knocks me out with Slash. Uh, okay. I decided to pivot to the second strategy, which is mimicking double team from the Persian. However, I arrive at it with such low health that I'm going to get knocked out if it ever gets a damage dealing move through. And in this case, it does. So I tried leveling up to 47 just to see if it would improve things a little bit, but no, no it doesn't. So I fight more trainers in Giovanni's gym, taking Flareon all the way up to level 48. Now, it's definitely time to start using some rare candies. If I use 5, I'll take Flareon up to level 53, and in this process it gets the chance to learn Flamethrower, which, of course, I teach in the place of Ember. And this level is also perfect for another reason, because 137 speed is enough to outspeed all of Giovanni's team members. Body Slam also one-hits the Doug Trio now, which is perfect. I can use Flamethrower on the Persian and potentially get a burn, but in this case it just one-hits, so maybe I won't need either Earthquake or Double team. Nidoqueen's next, I go for Flamethrower, it takes it to red health, Giovanni uses a guard spec, and I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, perfect, things are going really well. I one-shot the Nido King because of a critical hit, and all that's left is Ride On. I go for Flamethrower, it does half because this thing has low special, and it strikes back with Earthquake, which does so much damage. However, Flareon hangs on with four hit points and knocks the Rhinoceros out. So it's done it, it's made it to the final rival before the league. And this fiery doggo has answers to all of his Pokemon. Flamethrower one-shots the Sandslash, it one-shots the Execute, and it also one-shots the Cloister. I do have to two-shot the Magneton, which means it can paralyze me before the Kadabra comes out. It goes for Psychic, dealing a lot because of a critical hit, but Body Slam takes it down in one turn. All that's left is his Flareon. And because of good AI, this thing is either going to use Smog or Leer, uh, two very bad moves, and as a result I can finish it off with two uses of Body Slam. So Flareon is off to the league with a time of 53 minutes and 52 seconds. Alright, so at this point Flareon has definitely fallen significantly behind Vaporeon, and as a result I think this is sort of a race for second place. Let's see how Jolteon does in the late stages of the game. So for it there's two choices. I can potentially go to Cinnabar Island and attempt to fight Blaine, or I could go back to Sylph and fight the rival. I'm honestly a bit worried about Blaine, after all it gave Flareon a lot of problems. So let's try the rival in Sylph first. 
Unfortunately, the Sand Splash is still taking like almost no damage from Body Slam. It's gonna be a four hit. So I move on to the Cloister with less than half health. I uh, accidentally click Pin Missile, like ugh, I get confused as a result. And then I hit myself before knocking it out with a Thunderbolt. Next is Magneton and uh, this thing is gonna be a three hit. Luckily, it can only use Tackle, Sonic Boom, or Super Sonic against me, so I do knock it out and move on to the Kadabra. Body Slam gets a critical hit, knocking it out in one hit, and all that's left is the Flareon. But here, Body Slam misses because I was hit by Sand Attack from the Sand Slash. Flareon uses Fire Spin, and uh, yeah, that's it for Jolteon. I did try this fight again, and uh, it doesn't look like it's going very well. I knocked the Cloister out, I knocked the Magneton out over a tense four turns, and yeah, I'm going into the Kadabra with red health. Body Slam takes it out in a single hit, and then all of the luck aligns. Body Slam gets Paralysis, Flareon uses Sand Attack, not doing any damage to me, and it doesn't prevent the next Thunderbolt from connecting, so Flareon goes down, and finally Jolteon is victorious. I finish up the rest of Sylph, grab Mimic, and then I head to Sabrina's gym because Jolteon has more than enough speed. Also, it's worth remembering here that Pin Missile is super effective. That means with three hits, it's going to do similar damage to Body Slam, so I roll for it against the Abra and knock it out. Next is Kadabra. I get a four hit with Pin Missile here, so I knock it out in one turn. Next is Alakazam. I go for Pin Missile again. And Jolteon continues getting lucky here because it gets a five hit. Alakazam uses Psy Wave and it does the minimum damage of one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that move is so bad. Someone actually suggested to me on Discord that I should do a Psy Wave only playthrough, and uh, yeah, that sounds completely awful. Anyways, Jolteon manages to defeat the Psychic Gym Leader, and so now there's only two left. I have to face Blaine next, so I surf to Cinnabar Island, explore the mansion, and then progress through Blaine's gym, fighting none of the optional trainers as I go. Okay, let's see how this goes. Because electric moves are neutral against fire types, Thunderbolt makes the most sense here. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite do half to the Ninetales. It fails a Tail Whip, then hits with Quick Attack, and my second Thunderbolt paralyzes it, so I knock it out on the next turn. Okay, time for the Rapidash. Thunderbolt does half. It strikes back with Stomp, but Jolteon stays in green health, and then I finish it off with Thunderbolt on the next turn. Okay, time for the Arcanine. I'm feeling very optimistic here. Thunderbolt does almost half. Arcanine uses Takedown, and ah, uh, it gets a critical hit and knocks Jolteon out. Okay, but that fight wasn't going that poorly. In the next fight, however, it goes much worse because the Ninetales burns me, and I arrive at the Rapidash with only half health remaining. But then my luck turns around because Jolteon's high crit rate comes through and helps me knock the Rapidash out in a single turn. Okay, last is Arcanine. I get another critical hit here, and I also paralyze Blaine's ace. Then Arcanine misses takedown, and I knock it out with a follow-up Thunderbolt. And now with that gym finished, I'm starting to get worried, because up next for Jolteon is Giovanni. And there is going to be no way to get through this fight if I don't have Mimic for double team. I teach it in the place of Pin Missile, and now it's time to attempt. Let's see what I can do. At least in contrast to Flareon, I am outspeeding all of his Pokemon. I go for Body Slam, it does half to Dugtrio, he uses a Guard Spec, and then I knock it out on the next turn. Alright, that's the perfect start to the fight. I Mimic Double Team next, Persian hits with Fury Swipes, dealing a little bit, and then it hits again, which is unfortunate. And again? Are you kidding me? Okay, this thing has to start missing, and it does. I set up Double Team fully, and I one-shot it with Thunderbolt. Next is Nidoqueen, and because this thing is a ground type, Body Slam is my best move. Looks like it's going to be a three hit, which is really unfortunate. And the bad news continues, because Jolteon levels up to level 47 at this point, and it gets the chance to learn agility. But like, I don't want to get rid of any of these moves. Thunderbolt, Body Slam, Mimic, and Double Kick are all useful. I need Thunderbolt, obviously, as my primary damage dealing move. Body Slam is the best physical move that Jolteon can learn at this point without like using Double Edge, and I really don't want to use Double Edge. Mimic has great versatility, and I need Double Kick for the Ride On. Now we'll just go back in time here, and I really want to address what I was feeling in the moment. I thought that Badge Boosting is obviously so powerful, I need to learn Agility, because it's going to give Jolteon flexibility throughout the league, and allow me to solve problems that I otherwise wouldn't be able to at a lower level. I really want to mention this in the context of this being how I was feeling in the moment, because, uh, yeah, later on we were going to see the implications of making this decision to teach agility now. In the end, I decided to teach it in the place of double kick, and I just resigned myself to the fact that I was going to have to defeat the Rhydon with Body Slam alone. I defeat the Nido King, move on to the Rhydon, and then here, I set up agility three times to maximize my attack stat. And, uh, even after that, look at how much damage Body Slam is doing. And because of the PP that Jolteon has left, there is no way for me to win. 
also the Rhydon does hit an Earthquake through my double team and just knock me out. So yeah, that's unfortunate. However, there is another way to get through this fight with agility. Instead, I can use Rare Candies, learn Agility in the place of Body Slam, so I'll use Double Kick for the Nidos and the Rhydon, and then I can take on Giovanni. I don't get through the Dugtrio in very good shape this time, but I manage to set up Double Team fully against the Persian. After that, I start using Double Kick on the Nido Queen, and like, oh no, it's doing like no damage because this thing resists Double Kick because it's a Poison type. However, Double Team is very good, and it buys me the time that I need to knock it out. Nido King's next, and here we see the problem of trying to knock these things out over a long period of time. They get to constantly roll for Earthquake, and eventually it hits, knocking Jolteon out. Now at this point with Jolteon, I was starting to feel fairly hopeless. I fly back to Celadon to pick up some TMs for a Reflect. After all, this can cut Giovanni's damage, but like, what move do I put it in the place of? I'm not entirely sure. And at this point, Jolteon is nearing the time that Flareon went off to the league. So while Jolteon is struggling against Giovanni, let's see how Vaporeon does against the Elite Four. Lorelai's first and she sends in Dugong. My hope here is that after I set up Acid Armor completely, Body Slam is going to be doing enough damage to 3-shot the Dugong so that it can't constantly stall me with Rest. By the way, because Lorelei has good AI, you would think that she can only use Rest and Takedown with Dugong, but this isn't the case. In Yellow version exclusively, she has an AI modification that on some turns makes her Dugong consider all of its moves as neutrally effective against the opponent. So on those turns, she's going to be randomizing her move selection against me. As I finished my setup, I realized the fact that Surf is actually probably going to do more damage to the Dugong. After all, it has comparable effective power to Body Slam. I go for it, and I get the 3 hit, knocking it out. Cloister's next, Surf gets the 2 hit here. It does confuse me, however, before it goes down, which is really annoying. Okay, time for the slow bro. Now this thing is locked into using either Amnesia or Psychic, so as it sets up, it's going to get very scary. We go back and forth for a little bit. I take it all the way down to a sliver with Body Slam. It even gets paralyzed, but it strikes back with Psychic and knocks Vaporeon out. All right, so since I was trying to get through that fight with Surf anyways, I think it just makes sense to teach Mimic in the place of Body Slam. By doing this when I make it back to the Slowbro, I can Mimic Amnesia and set up alongside it. This means every time it hits me with Psychic, it's just going to be doing much less, and my Surf is going to continue outputting decent damage. I knock it out over four turns, move on to the Jinx, and now with my special stat almost maxed out, I'm able to one-shot it, move on to the Lapras, I take it down under half with one Surf, it uses Confuse Ray, but this doesn't prevent Vaporeon from attacking, and I knock it out on the next turn. So there's this guy, I have to fight him next, and then after that, there's Agatha. I'm going to use my standard strats here, use Mimic to steal Substitute, then at that point the first Gengar can't really do that much to me, like it does have Mega Drain, but when I set up Acid Armor, it's going to boost my special stat with the badge boost, and that'll make me have a little bit more survivability even against this super effective move. This fight is sort of a slog for Vaporeon. I should have used Ice Beam on the Golbat, it would have one hit, but Surf gets it done in two turns, oh well. The Haunter survives a decent number of hits. I make it to the Arbok, I don't one hit it either. She switches out into her final Gengar. I do almost half with Surf, and then it uses Hypnosis, which works through the Substitute and puts Vaporeon to sleep. As a result, it hits me with Psychic, breaking Vaporeon's Substitute, and then it sets up Confuse Ray. At least it uses Confuse Ray again on the next turn, wasting a turn. However, I stay asleep, it hits a follow-up Psychic, which gets a critical hit, and it also lowers Vaporeon's special by one stage. On the turn I wake up, it hits another Psychic, and this takes me down to red health, and it again lowers my special. So really, I have to hope for luck. I use Surf, it takes Gengar to red. Agatha uses a Super Potion, which is actually relevant healing here. Vaporeon hits itself in confusion. Luckily, Gengar is continuing to spam Confuse Ray. And then I take it down to a sliver. Agatha switches for Arbok, which gives me a free hit against it. And I, yeah, I'm faster than the Gengar, so when it comes back out, I knock it out. <laughs> like, I cannot believe this fight. It is a miracle that Vaporeon made it through it on its first attempt. There really should have been one reset there. Lance is next. He leads with Gyarados, and once I get through it, this fight is going to be much easier. My most powerful move against it is Ice Beam, despite the fact that it only does neutral damage. However, it does have the chance to freeze, which slightly improves my odds. And in this case, I actually knock it out over three turns, which isn't too bad. 
Lance has two Dragonairs next, and both of them are easy one hits with Ice Beam. Aerodactyl follows. I really should have used Surf here, like I know it would do more damage. I think what I was thinking is that Vaporeon has enough special to just one hit, but it really doesn't. Aerodactyl survives on red. Lance uses a Hyper Potion, and I'm like, ah, oh, this is annoying. I roll for damage again. It still doesn't knock the Aerodactyl out, and then finally I'm like, okay, I will use Surf to take it out. But this doesn't really matter because Dragonite's last, I'm faster, so I just one hit it with Ice Beam, and with that, Vaporeon has made it to the champion. And to this point, I have saved five rare candies, so I can level all the way up to 59 before this fight. I also teach Vaporeon rest in the place of Ice Beam, so now let's do this. He leads with Sand Slash, and this thing is the perfect lead for Vaporeon to go up against because it can just set up Acid Armor three times. By the way, Acid Armor's animation just makes your sprite disappear. Like, it is so weird. Anyways, that's why I have a disappearing Vaporeon in this fight. After I've set up completely, I have badge boosted all of my stats, and then I can mimic Earthquake, giving myself a ground type move to solve the Magneton. Surf 1 hits the Sand Slash next, Alakazam comes out, but I have Earthquake for it. It doesn't quite get the KO. Alakazam gets a crit with Psychic, which is the worst case scenario, but Vaporeon hangs on and I knock it out. Now Executor is next and Rest is perfect here because this thing just spams Leech Seed over and over again, which gives me a free chance to heal. The annoying part of this strategy is that now I do need to take some time to knock it out. I do have to take it out with Surf, and the champion even uses his full restore here to heal it. That is a very rare event. Like, I don't know what the percent chance of him using that is, but it's like 10% when the Pokemon is under 10% health or something like that. It's so rare. Finally, I do manage to knock out the strange coconut Pokemon and move on to the Magneton. And uh, here I made a misplay. I accidentally clicked on Surf and it does more than half, but not enough to one hit. So that's uh, a bit frustrating. I figured I might as well save time instead of switching between different moves. So I just went for Surf again. And despite paralysis, I do manage to knock the Magneton out. Okay, so it's time for Cloyster, and uh, it's just going to use Spike Cannon. And uh, my defense is sky high, so there's no chance that this thing knocks me out. I just heal with rest to ensure that I'm going to win, and then I knock the Cloyster out with Surf. It takes three hits, and all that's left is Flareon. At this point, I'm faster. It tries to hit me with Quick Attack, which does very little, and then I finish it off. So even in a sloppy champion fight, Vaporeon finishes the game. It clocks in with a time of 50 minutes and 38 seconds, with 6 resets at level 60. This took a game time of 3 hours and 5 minutes. I'm a bit disappointed that it didn't clock in under 50 minutes, but this is just the first preliminary playthrough. I think that there's easily a path to shave, so let's say, 4 minutes off its playthrough. I think it's sort of funny to note that Vaporeon beat the entire game faster than Jolteon beat the gym challenge. Like, this thing is significantly outperforming. However, before we go back to Jolteon, let's switch over and see how Flareon does with the league. First up is Lorelei. Now, Flamethrower does neutral damage here, so I do think that it's my best option. It does more than half to the Dugong, it strikes back with Bubble Beam, and lowers Flareon's speed. However, in this case, that isn't much of a problem because I still outspeed all of Lorelei's Pokemon except the Jinx. I one shot the Cloister with Flamethrower and move on to the Slowbro. Here I'm going to use the Mimic Strat again to take Amnesia. You might think that this is really risky, but the Slowbro is guaranteed to use Withdraw on the second turn. So things actually play out in the worst possible way in this fight, where it uses Surf first turn and then Withdraw the second turn. However, because I'm setting up with Amnesia, which boosts my Special, which is a defensive stat as well as an offensive stat in this generation, I'm getting significantly more bulky, so the next Surf does much less, and then I can fully set up, tank another Surf, and then knock the Slowbro out with Flamethrower. Now this setup badge boosted my speed, so I move first against Jinx, one-shot it with Flamethrower, and then I get a critical hit on the Lapras. Like, are you kidding? This bypasses my setup, allowing it to survive on red, use Hydro Pump, and knock Flareon out. But here's the thing about this fight. The previous fight I had, Slowbro spammed Surf way more than it normally will, because it has a 50-50 chance of using either Surf or Withdraw. In the next fight, I get much better luck, fully set up, and then move on to the Jinx with green health. So now, because I'm fully set up, even if the Lapras hits me with Hydro Pump, I'll probably survive. And as a result, I defeat Lorelei. I think at this point, it makes sense to delve into some Pokemon theory. Ground and Rock types are super effective against Fire types, right? And uh, Flareon doesn't have a particularly good defensive stat, so fighting types that have good attack stats should be strong against me. But uh, yeah, that's not the case. This guy is trash. I defeat him easily and move on to Agatha. 
Against her, Flareon matches up in the same way that Vaporeon did, but because I needed more levels earlier on, I am doing more damage and that makes this fight much easier. Granted, the final Gengar still could mess things up with Hypnosis, but uh, in this case it just misses and I knock it out. So Flareon is moving on to Lance now. And he has the potential to stop Flareon dead in its tracks because his first Pokemon is of course Gyarados. This thing is the worst enemy of any rock, ground, or fire types, especially if you have a slow speed stat. But luckily today I'm not Rhyhorn, so I do move first, hit Body Slam, and it almost does half. Gyarados then hits Hydro Pump, which does more than half to Flareon, and my next Body Slam doesn't knock it out. Lance, in response, uses a Hyper Potion, healing it fully, and then Flareon gets a critical hit, taking Gyarados all the way down to red health. But Gyarados still moves, uses Hydro Pump, and knocks me out. Alright, so my damage range just wasn't quite enough, so if I use one rare candy, I can go up to level 63 and deal more damage. However, this still doesn't give me the two hit against the Gyarados, but I do get paralysis, and Gyarados also misses two hydro pumps, so I knock it out. Body Slam almost takes down the following Dragonair, it survives but doesn't use Thunder Wave, which is really fortunate, and I move on to the next Dragonair. Now this thing does no Bubble Beam, and I want to be a little bit careful here, I think my special stat is high enough that I can use Rest, Heal Up, and then Steal Ice Beam. It ends up being that I was correct, I Steal Ice Beam, I Rest Up one more time, just to ensure that I have enough health to survive the Aerodactyl, after all it is faster than Flareon. Ice Beam 1 hits the Dragonair. Aerodactyl uses Hyper Beam, but Flareon survives, I knock it out with Ice Beam, and then Dragonite goes down to 4 times ice damage. So Flareon has made it to the champion with a time of 1 hour, 1 minute, and 55 seconds. But when will Jolteon even get to the league? My next attempt at Giovanni, I ended up trying out Reflect on my moveset to try and cut the damage from Earthquake. This actually does a decent job. Now I don't take half from Earthquake, and that gives me a turn to mimic Earthquake from the Doug Trio. The problem is Jolteon's attack stat just isn't high enough and I can't knock it out, so uh, yeah, that is not going to be consistent. I do manage to knock it out and get some luck against the Persian, so I get to the Nidoqueen to try out Earthquake and uh, yeah, it does like just over half and then Nidoqueen finishes me off with Earthquake. I tried the fight three more times, kind of alternating which strategies I used, like maybe reflect in the place of agility, keeping double kick, but... All of this is just not working, so let's revise the strategy again. What if I teach Jolteon Double Edge in the place of agility? With a critical hit, I'm now able to knock out Dugtrio in one hit. From there, I've retained Mimic so I can set up on the Persian. Double Kick takes it down, and now I have a faster way of knocking the Nidoqueen out. Double Edge can do it in two turns. However, my health is getting very low, and I just barely knock the Nidoking out with Double Edge, surviving on four hit points after recoil. So now let's see how Double Kick does against the Rhydon. And in this case, it does less than half and then Rhydon just like gets lucky, strikes Earthquake through Double Team and knocks Jolteon out. I attempted this one more time but I get to the Nidoqueen with less health so I can't knock it out with Double Edge. As a result, when I make it to the Nidoking, it knocks me out. And now at this point you're probably like, just use Rare Candies, get by Giovanni at a higher level. That is a terrible idea because, um, Sand Slash. <laughs> This thing is going to be brutal in the champion fight, and I need those rare candies later on after I've gained more levels. So now is the time to go and do some more training. And all of this training pushes Jolteon's time higher than Flareon's time when it defeated Lance. Here I'll mention the fact that I actually did a second poll, and the poll was which Pokemon is going to be the slowest, and overall people said that Flareon was going to be the slowest. And going into this challenge, I really thought that that was going to be the case, but right now it looks like the Fire Doggo is positioned to defeat Jolteon. However, it still could lose time if the champion poses too difficult, because after all the Sand Slash is both bad for the Flareon and Jolteon. But first the electric type is going to need to solve Giovanni. I come back at level 58 with the moveset Thunderbolt, Agility, Mimic, and Double Kick. But after a loss because I'm dealing too little damage to the Nidoqueen, I decide to once again forego Agility and teach Double Edge. And now I'll bring us back to when I first learned Agility. I actually think that that choice to learn it was a mistake overall for Jolteon. It got me in this constrained mindset of not exploring other options earlier on because I'm like, I really want to try to hold on to Agility however I can. But this Double Edge Double Team strategy is significantly better better. And while I do lose in the next fight, the following one gives Jolteon the luck it needs. And finally it defeats Giovanni. And with a time of 1 hour, 9 minutes, and 16 seconds. Alright, so for Jolteon to win, Flareon is going to have to have a very bad time against the champion. He leads with Sandslash. I go for Flamethrower because it has lower special, 
and I knock it out in one hit. All right, that is the first challenge for Flareon. Next is Alakazam. I'm just barely not outspeeding. It hits Psychic first turn, which does about a third. It doesn't lower my special, and then Body Slam knocks it out. Next is Executor. Flamethrower is super effective, and it knocks it out, I think because I got a critical hit, like maybe it would have survived. Executor does have good special after all. Magneton's next. Now, I think it's kind of a toss-up between Flamethrower and Body Slam here. I'm not sure which one would do more damage, but I went with Flamethrower. Either way, it allows me to knock it out in two turns. So it's time for Cloyster, and this might be the hardest Pokemon for Flareon to defeat. I go for Flamethrower, and it doesn't knock it out. That is not good. Cloyster strikes back with Clamp, and it misses. Perfect! So I knock the Cloyster out and move on to his final Pokemon, Flareon. It hits with Quick Attack, doing decent damage. Body Slam takes it under half. It doesn't go for Quick Attack again. I outspeed. And that's it. Flareon clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 2 minutes, and 47 seconds, with 18 resets at level 65. This took 3 hours and 34 minutes of game time. So Jolteon is going to get last place today, but by what margin? First, I have to get through the rival on Route 22. Against the Sand Slash, I use Mimic to Mimic Slash. After all, this move is always going to get a critical hit because it has a high critical hit ratio, and uh, yeah, with Jolteon speed, it's guaranteed. I'm not really sure why I made the choice to knock the Sand Slash out with Double Edge, like I should be using Slash, it's just much better. After that I slash the Execute, it survives. Luckily it doesn't cut my speed with Paralysis, instead it uses Poison Powder, which is much better. I knock it out on the next turn, now it's time for Cloyster, obviously Thunderbolt gets the job done. Against Magneton I 2 hit with Slash, 1 hit the Kadabra with Slash, and now it's time for the Flareon. And Slash takes care of it in 2 hits. Okay, so now Jolteon has the chance to go to the League, and after I go through Victory Road, I actually make a rare rare choice here, which is I backtrack to the power plant, and I pick up an extra rare candy. And I also knock out Zapdos for a little bit of fun. With it out of the way, I'm just about to level up to 63, so I train on some wild Pokemon, and then I head to take on Lorelei. Now finally Jolteon is off to the races, because uh, yeah, Thunderbolt is really good against Lorelei, like I do not need to use the Mimic strategy to set up with Amnesia, I can just Thunderbolt everything, yes the Jinx survives on red health, it uses Thrash which does like no damage and then I knock it out anyways. Lapras is last and Thunderbolt one hits. Now theoretically the next trainer could be scary, he has uh, ground type moves, but he's not scary. Jolteon wins on its first attempt, with taking almost no damage. So now it's time for Agatha, and all three of the evolutions have similar plays here against her. But in this case, Jolteon is actually the best against her because of context, it's the highest level, and Thunderbolt deals ridiculous damage. So I make it through her as well on my first attempt. And following her is Lance, but Gyarados isn't a threat, I one hit it with Thunderbolt. The next Dragonair also isn't a threat because it's never going to use Thunder Wave or Thunderbolt. By the way, Thunder Wave and having your speed cut here is like the worst possible outcome. That means I get to the third Dragonair, which uh, can't do much to me. I mimic Ice Beam and sweep the rest of his team. So Jolteon has completely stomped the league up until this point. And while his time is like half hour worse than the Vaporeon right now, it still has the potential to clock in under an hour and 30 minutes, I guess. So let's take on the champion and do this. He leads with Sand Slash. Now I'm going to have to use Reflect here to minimize damage from Earthquake, because I'm not knocking it out in one hit. I take about a third, and then I have to mimic Earthquake so that I can deal damage to it. Here's the thing though, it's going to do enough damage to me that I can't really strike back, so I use Rest to heal, and uh, yeah, I don't actually have a turn to attack here. Either I get knocked out, or I just endlessly rest, and in Generation 1 the enemy does not have PP, so I can't even stall out the Sand Slash. I try for Earthquake to see how much damage it does to Sand Slash, and like, oh no, this is really bad. Like, maybe Arcanine bad? I'm not sure though. Maybe I can solve this faster? What if instead of having Mimic in this fight, I use Toxic to defeat the Sand Slash? This way I can set up Reflect, then set up Toxic on the next turn so that the Sand Slash is taking damage, and then I can stall with Rest until the Sand Slash faints. Here's the thing though, remember the Executor with the Vaporeon? Yeah, the champion has full restores. He has one for each one of his Pokemon. So in this case, he uses it, and that heals Sand Slash, and that means I have to re-establish Toxic, which prolongs the duration of this fight. That means every time Sand Slash is rolling for Earthquake, it gets a chance to critical hit. And while this doesn't happen often, it is going to happen eventually and knock Jolteon out. But luckily in this case, I managed to outlast, and the Sand Slash goes down. Okay, time for the Alakazam next, but there's a problem here, because I didn't time rest well with the Toxic, so I'm still asleep, Alakazam goes for Psychic, and that takes Jolteon all the way down to 29 hit points. 
So Thunderbolt is not going to KO this thing in one hit. That means I have to use Rest again. And by doing this, it exposes me to a lot of damage. So much that the Alakazam takes Jolteon down to three hit points. I tried to use Rest again, but Jolteon's confused and it knocks itself out. So it looks like I might need a different way to solve the beginning of this fight. Ah, this moveset just feels so wrong on a Jolteon, but what about Toxic Rest, Mimic, and Reflect? Unfortunately, in the next fight, the Sandslash does get me with an Earthquake, which is really unfortunate. However, in the next fight, I am actually able to knock the Sandslash out and move on to the Alakazam. However, I'm still asleep. It hits with Psybeam, getting a critical hit, but luckily the Alakazam uses Recover on the next turn. Because of my new moveset, I can now use Earthquake and knock it out in a single hit. After that, Executor comes out, and I can stall this thing out with Toxic allowing Jolteon to progress to the Magneton. Obviously, Earthquake's super effective here. The Magneton just refuses to faint to it, though. Like, come on. It goes for Swift, and then I knock it out. Now, unfortunately, on the Cloister, I'm, uh, I'm gonna have to use Toxic here. <laughs> it's so awful using a Jolteon and having to use Toxic against this thing rather than Thunderbolt. However, once I've knocked it out, I move on to the Flareon, and with this, I think I've got it. Oh, gosh, unless it uses a Flamethrower and does so much to Jolteon. Okay, that was a critical hit. Um, I should probably rest here just to be safe. The nice thing is if Flareon goes for Fire Spin, it actually wakes me up faster because Fire Spin is a multi-turn move. As a result, I can start striking back with Earthquake. It isn't doing much because I have minus one attack, but eventually after a couple more heals, Jolteon is able to take the victory. It clocks in under an hour and a half with a time of one hour and 29 minutes with 20 resets at level 69. So uh, I guess something's nice about this. This playthrough took it 4 hours and 40 minutes of game time. So let's reflect on our first preliminary results. Vaporeon is by far the fastest, being the only Pokemon of the three that was able to get a sub-hour time. Flareon clocked in roughly 12 minutes slower, and yeah, Jolteon was a distant third place, being about 26 minutes slower than Flareon. But of course, I have to optimize these three. So how fast can Vaporeon go? Can it get a sub-45 minute time? I think it might be possible. With Flareon, how far under an hour can it get? And uh, for Jolteon, like, can it even hope to redeem itself? Let's find out. So let's start with Vaporeon. The thing is, I don't have very much good news about optimizing this playthrough, because there's very little that I can do to improve its time. After all, it was already beating Brock on minimum battles, and obviously I'm just gonna do that again. I decide to fight Misty again before the rival on Nugget Bridge. I do think this is the best play to get Bubble Beam as fast as possible. It got a little bit close, but I still managed to pull through without a reset. And from here, of course, Vaporeon is on a tear. I grab Rest, Body Slam, the Rare Candy, defeat the rival on the SSN, and then I go up against Surge. Now, theoretically, this should be the hardest battle in the game, and he has the potential to beat you if he uses Thunderbolt twice in a row, but yeah, he's like never gonna do that. <laughs> so Vaporeon beats him on its first attempt. Once again, I decide to skip the hideout in Celadon City. That gives me enough money to buy three vitamins, so I pick up three Carbos to improve Vaporeon's low speed stat. After completing Pokemon Tower, Cycling Road, and the Safari Zone, I head back to Erica's gym, and this is a concession I made in the optimization stage. Defeating her now will give Vaporeon the experience it needs to be able to be at level 34 before the rival in Sylph. The problem is, is that I can't one-shot the Weeping Bell or the Gloom unless I get a critical hit. That exposes Vaporeon to Sleep Powder, but in this case she just misses two, so yeah, I did it. Of course, even if she lands Sleep Powder, it isn't a guaranteed loss. So while this fight isn't consistent, I do think it's the fastest way to get through the mid-game. Then in Sylph, I fight an extra trainer. I actually, uh mapped one of the trainers earlier on incorrectly, and because of that I need to fight one more person. This gives Vaporeon level 34, and that means I can use 6 rare candies to take it all the way up to level 40. This is over 3 more damage rounding thresholds, and it basically trivializes this fight. Sandslash is a 1 hit, the Cloister is sometimes a 2 hit, but in this case a 3 hit, Magneton goes down over 2 hits, and then his final 2 Pokemon, the Kadabra and the Flareon, are both 1 hits. And then because I fight Jesse and James, Giovanni, and the 2 jugglers in Koga's gym next, Vaporeon is level 43 for Koga. This is important to improve the damage ranges against the first three Venonats, so that I have more health for the final Venomoth. I have a guaranteed one hit on the first one, an 89% chance to one hit the second one, and a 53% chance to one hit the third one. In this case it survives and then knocks itself out with double edge. Last is the Venomoth, and its maximum damage with a critical hit is only doing 33% damage to Vaporeon, so there's no chance that this thing is going to knock me out. 
The only way that I could be knocked out is if I take too long to defeat the first three Venonats. They use Psychic too many times, lowering Vaporeon special, and then Venomoth uses Psychic. After that, I take on Blaine. Uh, he's pretty easy for Vaporeon, but it actually gets a little bit close. After all, Blaine is a bit of a wild card. And now I think you can see why I chose Carbos as my vitamins, because now Vaporeon is outspeeding the Abra, so I can knock it out in one hit with Body Slam and not get hit by Flash. This makes Sabrina so much more consistent, and here I defeat her on my first attempt. So still no resets in this playthrough. At this point in the game I only have three rare candies left over, so I'm going to fight one additional trainer in Giovanni's gym. It's uh, this cool trainer with two ground types. They're both one hits, so it's really fast, and this gives Vaporeon enough experience to level up to level 47 and learn Acid Armor, which of course I teach in the place of Bubble Beam. Then by using the three rare candies, I push Vaporeon over two more damage rounding thresholds up to level 50. And now this fight is very trivial. The only way I can lose is if the uh, Doug Trio uses Fissure. If it doesn't, I just one hit the Doug Trio. I uh, one hit the Persian in this case because of a critical hit, otherwise it would have been a two hit. And then the Nido Queen, the Nido King, and the Rhydon are all one hits. Just so everyone knows, if I went into that fight at level 47, both the Nido Queen and the Nido King had chances of surviving. The Nido Queen had a 4% chance to survive, and the Nido King had a 13% chance to survive. Obviously, I'd rather just be at the level to one hit them and not have to play around with a chance that Thunder could paralyze me. So I've talked over the rival before the league, like he's really easy, just set up acid armor and then sweep with Surf, Body Slam, and Ice Beam. Pretty simple. And now we've made it to the league. Obviously for Lorelei, mimicking Amnesia is the strongest strategy, just because Vaporeon doesn't really have a move that can deal good damage to any of her water ice types. The unfortunate downside to this strategy is that it's not 100% consistent, because the Slowbro can knock me out with Psychic, and in this case, that is what happens. However, on my second fight, I am going to take the victory, so that's only one reset for Vaporeon, and it only cost about 40 seconds of time. If you look at the timer, Vaporeon is still set to clock in with a very good finish, so I don't think we need to worry yet. So because I'm using mostly the same strategies that I was using last time, let's talk about something different during the league. What would be alternate ways to improve Vaporeon's time against each league member that isn't the strategy that I'm going for currently? Obviously leveling up for Lorelei would improve things, but there is a very high potential that Vaporeon will just get through this fight on its first attempt, although that didn't happen here, so I felt that leveling would just be wasted time. If you saw my Gligar live playthrough, it's a similar situation that happened at the end of that playthrough. I could level up more, waste time doing that, and then just luck through the final fight because you have a decent shot to do so. In this case with Vaporeon, I think it has much better odds than Gligar, but I just got a bit unlucky in this playthrough. For Agatha, there are two ways that the fight can fall apart. I can be forced to use Substitute too many times on the first Gengar because it spams Mega Drain, or the Haunter or final Gengar can use Hypnosis, putting me to sleep, and then defeat me. Once again here, Vaporeon doesn't have an option from its learn set that would improve this fight, just spamming Surf is going to be the best option, like, yeah, Hydro Pump will do more damage, but no, that is not a good idea. Also, I could potentially fish for more freezes with Ice Beam or Blizzard, but I think I'd rather just have more damage output with Surf. Leveling up could give me more damage ranges, but just like Lorelei, I think the chances of getting through this fight are high enough that that doesn't make any sense, and so that leads us all the way to Lance. And once again, this fight is kind of inconsistent against him, but it's because of only one Pokemon, the Gyarados. After it goes down, I will have guaranteed one hits on all four of his remaining Pokemon, and I outspeed three of them, with only the Aerodactyl being able to hit me. For the Gyarados, I have like a half percent chance to two hit it, a 33% chance to three hit it, and a guaranteed four hit with Ice Beam. Because this move also has a 10% chance to freeze, that is a potential avenue to victory because Lance doesn't have a full restore for each of his Pokemon, he instead has Hyper Potions. Because Lance has good AI, he's going to spam only Leer, Dragon Rage, and Hyper Beam with Gyarados, always avoiding Hydro Pump. And uh, yeah, Hyper Beam is a physical move and Dragon Rage doesn't do very much damage, after all, Vaporeon has excellent HP. So by spamming Acid Armor, I can minimize the damage from Hyper Beam, and then just use Rest to heal if I need to, and slowly knock the Gyarados out with Ice Beam. This also badge boosts me and means that Ice Beam doesn't take so long to knock the Gyarados out. After it goes down, his team is an easy sweep, and while the Aerodactyl does outspeed, I have Acid Armor set up and all of its attacks are physical. 
So the only risk for Vaporeon to lose in this fight is if the Gyarados gets a critical hit with Hyper Beam, which actually happened in this fight, uh, but Vaporeon still survived because it has so much health. And uh, yeah, if the Aerodactyl gets a critical hit with, say, Hyper Beam or Fly, and Vaporeon was at a low-ish amount of health by that portion of the fight. Today, I take a first attempt victory, and I move on to the champion. This fight is much the same. I use Acid Armor to set up at the beginning of the battle. By the way, I only need two of these to guarantee two hits on all the important Pokemon. Then I one-hit the Sand Slash with Surf. I want to take it out as fast as possible so I don't get hit by a critical hit Slash. Then I have to face Alakazam. Now this thing is a guaranteed two-hit with Surf, so it can be a little bit inconsistent if it uses Kinesis or drops my special with Psychic. Also, it can survive for more turns if it uses Recover, like it does in this fight, but I knock it out anyways. Next is Executor. It's going to set up Leech Seed and then spam Leech Seed over and over and over again because I'm a water type. So I try Ice Beam first turn. If it freezes, then I won't get hit by Leech Seed, which would be ideal. But that doesn't happen today, so it gets the annoying status condition off. This means I have to take my time here so I can heal because Magneton is next. Now you might think that wouldn't mimicking Earthquake for this thing be a better choice? But that would mean that I would have to have faced Lance without rest, and that would have led to one reset there. However, if I did mimic Earthquake here for the Magneton, it actually only has an 11% chance to one hit. So overall, I think the best play for both of these fights is to just two hit the Magneton with Surf. In this case, I survive Thunderbolt and move on to the Cloister. Now because of Acid Armor, Spike Cannon is going to be doing very little to me, and while this fight takes a while because I have to use Rest, Spike Cannon can get crits, which are annoying, but I'm able to eventually defeat the Cloister. After that, all that's left is Flareon, and Surf is a guaranteed one hit. So Vaporeon clocks in with a time of 45 minutes and 5 seconds, with one reset at level 59, and this took 2 hours and 57 minutes of game time. So for a tier list ranking, where does that leave Vaporeon? Well, it had a slower time than Gengar, Nidoking, and Nidoqueen, but it was slightly faster than Mr. Mime. Also in general, I think that just figuring out Vaporeon was much easier than figuring out Mr. Mime. So today Vaporeon gets the fourth overall spot in my tier list. But will this be enough for it to be the best evolution? Well, uh, Flareon might have something to say about that, so let's see how much I can optimize this thing. Mirroring what happened with the Vaporeon playthrough, there isn't very much for Flareon to improve in the early game. If it faces Brock at a level under 10, it is just not going to get good damage ranges and be able to knock his Pokemon out fast enough. Things get a little bit sketchy, but if I face him at level 10, it's actually quite easy. Obviously Nugget Bridge first, then the SSN, then back to Misty. I'll go over the damage ranges against her, because it seems like she should be difficult for Flareon, but uh, she really isn't. Body Slime has a guaranteed one hit on the Staryu, and I outspeed, but then Starmie is moving first. However, here's the thing. Even if Starmie uses Bubble Beam two turns in a row, it only has a 27% chance to knock Flareon out. However, it's far more likely that she'll use Water Gun or an X-Defend on one of the turns, or Body Slime could get Paralysis, and then Flareon would move first on the second turn, and it only needs two Body Slimes to knock her ace out. So no resets for Flareon so far. Surge is a little bit inconsistent for Flareon, that's because Mega Kick has a 61% chance to two-hit Flareon, but like, what is the chance that Surge will use Mega Kick twice in a row? Like, that seems very unlikely, and Body Slime has a guaranteed two-hit against him. And that leads me to the next major challenge that Flareon faced in the playthrough, which was the self-destructing hiker. Of the two strategies, number one, Ember, number two, using Sand Attack, using Ember is obviously the better choice. At this level, it two hits both of the Geodudes and three hits the Graveler. And if Ember has a 10% chance to burn, and I'm using it on four turns where it doesn't get the KO, then Flareon has a decent shot of burning one of his Pokemon, and in that case it would really reduce the damage that they would deal with a move like Rock Throw or Self Destruct. In this case, I get by him on my first attempt. I explore the hideout because the vitamins and the rare candy are very important. Then I buy four Carbos and one Calcium. This is so I can continue to use the Carbos that appear for free throughout the rest of the playthrough. If I just used five Carbos here, then I would have an ineffective vitamin later on. I train against all the trainers in Erica's gym, then I defeat her. She's very easy for Flareon. 
I clear Pokemon Tower, the Safari Zone, and then I head to Sylph. Now, in addition to the two trainers that I fight in almost every playthrough, the Machoke guy and the Arbok guy, I am going to fight six additional trainers with Flareon. The last of which is this guy who blocks off the healing room, then I can use the healing room to restore Flareon's HP and PP, and then I take on the rival at level 40. Now the Sand Slash could be a bit annoying because I don't have a guaranteed 2 hit with Ember, I only have a 23% chance to 2 hit it, but I am able to take it out consistently with 3 hits. After that it's time for the Cloister, I have a guaranteed 3 hit against it, a 23% chance to 2 hit once again, it's the exact same situation as the Sand Slash. But after that things get much better, Body Slam has a guaranteed 2 hit on the Magneton, a guaranteed 1 hit on the Kadabra, which I am now outspeeding by 2 points. And then I have a guaranteed 2 hit on the Flareon, so it could have hit me with Bite and done a lot of damage, but in this case it doesn't and I win the fight. Overall I'd say that's the fight that Flareon has the least likelihood of winning in the playthrough to this point. But doing all of that in this order was important, so that Flareon would be level 44 for Koga. This gives an 80% chance to one hit the first Venonat, a 33% chance to one hit the second one, and then I would have to crit the third one to knock it out. I get a bad range on the second one today, I get confused as a result, but I don't hit myself knocking out the final two Venonats. Venomoth is next, and it makes sense to switch into Body Slam here. There's a 52% chance that I will two hit it, and I once again get the unfavorable range today, like come on. So I have to take it out on the third turn, but that's fine, Flareon survives and still no resets. Now after Koga's speed boost, Flareon has exactly 104 speed, which is one more than Sabrina's Abra. So might as well face her now, after all Body Slam is just gonna like completely devastate her team. The Alakazam does survive, it gets a bit annoying but I critical hit it and knock it out on the second turn. So with that I've made it all the way to Blaine, and this is probably the second hardest fight up until this point in the playthrough. I still think the Sylph Rival is slightly harder. The reason Blaine is so difficult is that I don't have guaranteed 2 hits on any of his Pokemon. I have a 26% chance to 2 hit the Ninetales, and a 39% chance to 2 hit the Rapidash. Today of course, Flareon doesn't get either of them. And then it's most likely that I'm going to 3 hit the Arcanine, I have a 50% chance of doing that. I have a very rare 1.5% chance to 2 hit it, but it doesn't happen here. Either way I resist most of Blaine's moves because he has fire moves, so really I'm just like hoping that his random AI doesn't pick the normal moves, and in this case I get the luck I need to win. In Giovanni's gym I fight 3 additional trainers so that Flareon levels up to 48. Now all of this that I've been doing to this point has synergized so that now I can use 10 rare candies to level Flareon up from 48 to 58 before Giovanni. Watch my speed as I do this, because as soon as I get to 58, I have 136 speed, which is one more than the Persian and three more than the Dugtrio. So this is why all of this training and taking some fights at slightly lower levels, as well as using the four Carbos earlier on, was really important. Before the fight I'm also going to teach Flareon Mimic, and this is one move away from Flareon's final move set. By teaching Mimic in the place of Quick Attack, so now I have Body Slam, Mimic, Fire Blast, and Flamethrower. I know that seems weird, but sometimes I do need the additional damage from Fire Blast to get the favorable ranges. So here's how Giovanni goes. I have a guaranteed one hit with Body Slam against the Dugtrio. Then for Persian, I may make double team and I set it up. This is because of Giovanni's Ride On. With Fire Blast, I can do 61 to 72% damage against it, so I'd have to bank on a 12.5% chance to critical hit or a burn to beat the Ride On without double team. After I'm set up, I move on to the Nidos. Now here I actually make a mistake and use Fire Blast against both of the Nidos. I should have used Flamethrower because I had badge boosts. But uh, if I didn't have badge boosts, I need Fire Blast for the consistent ranges there. And then on the ride on I realize this and I'm like, I should be using Flamethrower. And by the way, my special has been boosted enough that yeah, I just knock it out with one hit. So that is another reason that double team is better. From here, Flareon has done all of its additional training, now I only have to defeat the mandatory trainers in my way. Flamethrower has a one hit on the Sand Slash, it has a one hit on the Execute, it has a one hit on the Cloister, but unfortunately Fire Blast is required to one hit the Magneton. I only have a 15% chance to one hit it with Flamethrower, but also I have the chance to miss with Fire Blast, like I missed too many times here. Very frustrating. At least the Magneton doesn't mess me up. I want to hit the Kadabra with Body Slam and then two hit the Flareon. So we've made it to Lorelei, and here obviously the best strategy is to mimic Amnesia from the Slowbro. Flareon can very easily make its way through the Dugong and the Cloister. The Dugong just loves to sleep and the Cloister is a one hit with Flamethrower. Now the Slowbro isn't risky because it's going to use Withdraw on the second turn and then after that I'm going to be so set up that it's not going to deal very much damage with Surf anyways. After that it's time for Flamethrower and the rest of Lorelei's team falls. 
Okay, so once again, Flareon has a more consistent Agatha than Vaporeon. That's just because here, I am a higher level, also Flareon already has a higher time than Vaporeon. But additionally, the first Gengar does not have super effective damage with Mega Drain. Things get a little bit close by the end of this fight because I'm on orange health, but uh, it doesn't really matter and in the end, Flareon wins. Now let's talk about Lance. This fight is probably the most inconsistent fight in this entire playthrough. Obviously, you probably anticipated that because as a Fire-type, Flareon does not stack up very well against his Gyarados. However, it's actually better against the Gyarados than most other Fire-types, like, as the physical attacking Fire-type, Flareon is the best. It stacks up against the Gyarados better than both Arcanine and Rapidash. That's because it has an 82% chance to two-hit with Body Slam. So the things that could go right against the Gyarados are that Body Slam could paralyze it and force it to not move. It could also miss Hydro Pump, which is a 20% chance event, and Flareon could also get a critical hit. Granted, if it does that, it will not one-shot the Gyarados, but Lance could use a Hyper Potion to heal it and give me another roll with Body Slam. The ways I can lose here are if Gyarados gets a critical hit with Hydro Pump. In that case, Flareon faints to a single hit. The other way I can potentially lose is if Gyarados hits Hydro Pump twice because Flareon gets the 18% chance to not two hit. Either way, this isn't something to be worried about because Flareon is able to regularly get by the Gyarados. But this is where the fight gets truly frustrating. You'll notice that I replaced Flamethrower with Rest. A lot of you are probably like, this is a terrible idea, Flamethrower is the best fire move, please keep it. No, I need to do this. And the reason is I have to heal against the second Dragonair. First turn, I use Body Slam just in case it paralyzes, because then when I'm asleep, the Dragonair is more likely to miss hits. The reason I have to heal is because Aerodactyl is going to outspeed me and Flareon doesn't have good defenses. If the Aerodactyl gets a crit with Fly or Hyper Beam, Flareon is finished, but I could survive crits from Wing Attack or Swift, and if I have enough health, I'll survive regular hits from Fly and Hyper Beam. After I have green health, I can knock out the first Dragonair and move on to the second one. Here I need to mimic Ice Beam so that I can one-shot Lance's three final Pokémon, but there's a complication here. The Dragonair knows that Flareon's a Fire-type, so it's going to spam Bubble Beam, and this move has a 33% chance to lower my speed. If it does, Flareon will be slower than Dragonite, so it's going to take a hit from Lance's two final Pokémon, which likely will result in a loss. So what really has to happen here is I have to two-shot the Gyarados, not get paralyzed against the first Dragonair and heal, then on the second Dragonair mimic Ice Beam without having my speed lowered, and after that if Aerodactyl doesn't get a crit, I win. You're probably thinking, Scott, this does not seem particularly consistent. And here's the thing though, what's the alternative? If I level up more, yes, I will more consistently knock out the Gyarados, but I'll trade a lot of time for that, and an 82% chance to hit is pretty good. Also, leveling up will not give me one hits on either of the Dragonairs, and Flareon has no moves that can potentially one hit the Aerodactyl or the Dragonite. Also, trying to outspeed the Aerodactyl is just not possible, so I really think trying to get through on this level is the best play. I actually got very lucky today because I didn't get a single reset. That is, like, supreme luck. But now that I've cleared that challenge, things are much easier for Flareon against the Champion. There are three inconsistencies in this fight. The first one is the fact that Fire Blast can miss. However, I need it to ensure one hits against key Pokemon, like the Sand Slash, for instance. Next is Alakazam, and this is the second inconsistency, because Flareon doesn't outspeed at this level. By the way, I would need to be level 67 to outspeed the Alakazam, and that just seemed like it wasn't worth it. Of all its moves, I just don't want to have a special drop from Psychic, or be hit by Kinesis, which lowers Fire Blast's accuracy. And that leads me to the final inconsistency after I knock the Executor out, and that's the fact that the Magneton can paralyze Flareon. If it does, I don't outspeed Cloyster, and then it will just clamp me to death. However, if it doesn't, I can use Fire Blast to knock it out, and then finish off his Flareon, and with that, my Flareon clocks in with a time of 50 minutes and 55 seconds, with one reset at level 65. This took 3 hours and 20 minutes of game time. I did not expect these results with Flareon, but honestly, it is quite a powerful fire type. Still, of the Generation 1 fire types for a solo playthrough, Ninetales is superior, but Flareon is in a close second place right now. I will have to do replays with Charizard and Magmar at some point in the future, and of course, Moltres is waiting for me in the distant future. That one is not going to be fun. So today, with this time, Flareon earns itself the spot just ahead of Clefable at the top of the A tier. But where will Jolteon fit in? So, let's find out. So with my previous Jolteon run, there was a very clear mistake, and you may have already identified what it was. 
And it's just the fact that I thought that Jolteon could make use of agility to use the badge boost. After doing a first playthrough, I can now see that this was logically flawed, at least in Pokemon Yellow. I could see Jolteon making use of agility in Pokemon Red and Blue, but in this game, I just don't think it's possible. That's because of all the challenging foes that Jolteon faces, it doesn't actually get an opportunity to set up with agility anyways. And then the Pokemon that are truly threats usually have the ground type like Sand Slash, and so you just have to knock them out with a normal move anyways, and Jolteon doesn't have very good physical attack, and so yeah, because it's getting a percentage boost with the badge boost, its attack is not improving as much as its special is. Also, agility boosts Jolteon's speed, and it already has so much speed, it does not need any more, so this move is just not useful. Now we do need to remember that in Generation 1 there are no move reminders, so in the first playthrough I really wanted to include it on Jolteon's moveset just in case I needed it. If I said no to it before I faced Giovanni, then I didn't have an option to get it back later in the playthrough. However, the consequence of trying to play safe in this way was I gave up Body Slam far too early in the playthrough. Now yes, Double Edge has 15 more base power, but Body Slam's 30% chance to paralyze is like so key. Also, the fact that it doesn't deal recoil damage is very important, especially for the champion Sand Slash. So for Jolteon, I'm not going to be changing much until the mid-game, where I have to put in a lot of extra training. One way to save a lot of time in a playthrough is just be much more deliberate about when you're training. Like, I am just going to level up 10 times in the mid-game in Sylph fighting every single trainer, which is exactly what I'm going to do here. By doing this, you save time in two different ways. You minimize a ton of resets because you're going into every major fight at a higher level. This saves a bunch of walking time, backtracking out of the gym, going to train, then coming back to the gym, attempting the fight again, as well as the lost time from the fight. After all, resetting does give you information of the fight, but it doesn't materially move your playthrough forward in any way, whereas just grinding more gives you more levels and more damage. In addition to fighting everyone in Sylph, I am also going to fight everyone in the fighting dojo. These trainers give a lot of stat experience to your attack stat, which is going to be important for the champion at the end of the game. Once I'm finished here, I want to avoid backtracking to any other region of the map, so I'm just going to stay in Saffron City, go back to Sylph, and fight the rival now that Jolteon's level 45. This fight is pretty consistent, however it isn't ideal. The first Sand Slash is probably going to be a 3 hit, I have an 88% chance to 3 hit it. I actually have a 6.5% chance to 2 hit it, but that doesn't happen today. Obviously the Cloister is a 1 hit with Thunderbolt. I have a 67% chance to 2 hit the Magneton with Body Slam, and then I 1 hit the Kadabra with Body Slam and I get a lucky critical hit, which is the only way for me to one-hit the final Flareon. Now that I've finished doing all of that training in Sylph, I'm going to backtrack to Erika's gym, fight only the mandatory beauty, and then defeat Erika. She's very easy. Yes, I don't have Pid Missile. I probably could have it in the place of Sand Attack. Like, Sand Attack's just there because I don't have Mimic yet. With her out of the way, I defeat the mandatory trainers in Koga's gym, and then I face him. Thunderbolt's a guaranteed one hit on all of the Venonats, so if I don't get a Gen 1 miss, I'm gonna make it to the Venomoth with my stats and my health intact. I actually went into this fight with a little bit of damage on my Jolteon, I was that confident. And uh, yeah, it was totally fine, I beat Koga on my first attempt. Now the next portion of the game is where Jolteon needs to put in more time doing training. After all, to defeat the champion Sand Slash, I am going to need a very high level. My goal is 70. So I finish off all of the trainers in Blaine's gym before I face him. Jolteon has guaranteed two hits on both the Ninetales and the following Rapidash. And at this level, it almost has a guaranteed two hit against the Arcanine. It has a 94% chance to two hit this thing. Unfortunately, today the Arcanine uses its most powerful move against Jolteon, which is Takedown. My defense is lowered by one stage, and as a result, it knocks me out. So that's my first reset. But I managed to defeat him on my next attempt. I defeat Sabrina next, by the way she's pretty easy, and then I go and train in Giovanni's gym. Next I head to the power plant to collect the rare candy here, and that gives me 11 rare candies in total, so at level 54 if I feed all of them to Jolteon, I take it all the way up to level 65. Even at this level, Jolteon does not have a guaranteed one hit with Body Slam against Giovanni's Doug Trio. But still it has a 92% chance to one hit, so I do think that going up to level 68 would just be overkill. I get lucky and knock it out with one hit, and now at the Persian I am going to mimic double team and set it up, 
My rule set that doesn't ban evasion moves is specifically this way because in Pokemon Yellow, fire types, poison types, and electric types would just get walled at Giovanni until they're like level 80. Like this fight is so hard for these types. Body Slam only has a 44% chance to two hit the Nidoqueen and Nidoking. Getting hit by two earthquakes in a row is uh, not very good, so I need a way to play around that. Unfortunately today though, while double team does get me by both the Nidoqueen and Nidoking, I take a little bit of damage, move on to the Rhydon, use double kick, which even after six turns of setup does not take this thing down in one turn, and then Giovanni's Ace connects with Earthquake, and Jolteon survives with seven hit points. Okay, so we've done it, we're off towards the league. Now next is the rival before Victory Road, and there's really only one problem with this fight, which is the fact that I can't one-hit the Execute. That means it can use Stun Spore and cut my speed, and then Jolteon's gonna take a lot of damage from the following Pokémon and there's the potential to lose. However, in this case, it doesn't use Stun Spore, so the rest of the fight's very easy. Now in Victory Road, I of course need to pick up the Rare Candy, so this is Jolteon's 12th Rare Candy, and then I also need to fight one trainer. This guy here, he has three water types, a Kingler, a Tentacruel, and a Blastoise. They all give really good experience. And while this doesn't level Jolteon up, it gives it enough experience to get to level 70 by the time it gets to the champion. Okay, so it's time for the league. This is really easy. Thunderbolt for Lorelei, obviously. Now you'll notice that for the next trainer, I actually don't have Double Kick anymore. And my intention was actually to teach Rest in the place of Double Kick for Lorelei. Um, but I just forgot, and it doesn't matter because she's so bad against Jolteon anyways. In this case, I'm actually just going to use Mimic to steal Dig, and this gives Jolteon a good way to get around the rock ground types here. Agatha's next. A little inconsistent because it always is. I Mimic Substitute, and then I sweep with Thunderbolt. But today, I get through on my first attempt, so yep. The experience from this fight levels Jolteon up to level 69. Nice. And with one rare candy, I can take Jolteon up to level 70 for Lance. Now it's at a high enough level that it actually isn't going to level up before the end of this fight. Also, yes, if I didn't fight that trainer in Victory Road, I would be level 68 now, and then I would use a rare candy up to 69, and then the experience from the Lance fight would not get me to level 70. Luckily for Jolteon, the Lance fight is also quite easy. I'd say that the middle two battles in the Elite Four are actually easy for Jolteon, mostly because his level is so high at this point. I actually made a mistake here in the Lance fight. I used Body Slam against the second Dragonair. It's really sloppy. I just want to mimic Ice Beam and then knock it out on the next turn, so one extra turn of time there for me. I'm just so happy here that Jolteon doesn't have a problem like Flareon where it's not outspeeding the Aerodactyl. It's really nice to just one-shot this thing and not fear it. Dragonite goes down, and with that, Jolteon has made it to the champion with a time just over an hour. Okay, so what's my solution to this fight? Well, here's my moveset. Thunderbolt, Rest, Reflect, and Body Slam. There is no way I want to finish this game with a Jolteon that has Toxic on its moveset, and I really want to have Thunderbolt on my moveset. So against Sandslash, I just lose if it gets a critical hit with Earthquake. That's just how it is. And uh, that's what happens in my very first fight against him. So how do I win? Well, at this level, I have a 6.4% chance to 2-hit the Sand Slash with Body Slam, and I have a 59% chance to 3-hit it. After using Reflect, I will sometimes survive 3 hits from Earthquake, and if I do, my Jolteon will get its third hit in and get a chance to roll for the 59% to knock out. Improving my odds here is the fact that Body Slam can paralyze. If it does, there's the chance that the Sand Slash doesn't attack. And this is the ideal situation for me. I really want to paralyze the Sand Slash, have it not attack, and then knock it out so that I get through the fight with decent health for the Alakazam. But uh, that does not happen today. I only have 7 hit points left. So I uh, just have to go for the Body Slam and hope. The only way I knock this thing out is if I get a critical hit, but I don't today. But Alakazam can just miss with Kinesis or use Recover. In this case, it goes for Recover, so I knock it out. Honestly, not an ideal opening to the fight, but once I make it to the Executor, because I have Rest, I can heal up and then proceed to knock the final four Pokémon out with decent health. I just want to say I did try Double Edge against the Sand Slash because yes, it has better damage ranges, but the recoil means that it knocks me out in one fewer turns. And then the lack of a chance to paralyze really puts Jolteon in a bad position. I think if I had had Body Slam on my moveset previously, I would have figured out this strategy instead. I take the Executor out, the Magneton can't really do anything to me, the worst thing it could do is Screech and lower my defense. But after I knock it out, the Cloister's an obvious one hit, and Flareon is last. Against it, I have a guaranteed two hit with Thunderbolt, unless I crit, which is what happens here. Thank you Jolteon Speed, you were useful in this case, so 
Jolteon clocks in with a time of 1 hour, 1 minute, and 10 seconds, with 2 resets at level 71, and this took 3 hours and 59 minutes of game time. So what spot has Jolteon earned in my tier list with these results? Well, its time is slower than both Farfetch'd and Porygon, but it is faster than Wigglytuff and Omanyte. So Jolteon earns a spot in the middle of the B tier. And now we can compare final results of all of the Gen 1 evolutions. Of course, Vaporeon is by far the best, Flareon is in second place, and Jolteon is in a distant third place. Of course, Vaporeon improved its results by the smallest margin today, Flareon improved by the next amount, and Jolteon is definitely the most improved player of the day. I just want to say here that this is why I always do multiple playthroughs, because the ability to learn from my mistakes, implement changes, and then rank the Pokemon based on my improved results just seems fairer for all of these cute little creatures that I love so much. So now that we've finished the evolutions in Generation 1, I, uh, I think we're going to have to test the evolutions in Generation 2, so stay tuned for that video next week. Before then, a lot of other daily content, so I'll see you in those videos. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo, and comment because I gotta read them all. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. If you've made it this far, you're incredible.